here with us we have eminent international and national faculty who have shown expertise over the years in both robotic and vats our international faculty are dr kelvin lau sir is clinical director thoracic surgeon and consultant at st bartholomew's hospital london we have dr norberto santana rodic sir minimal invasive thoracic and robotic surgeon specialized in primary unipot vats from mayo clinic uae our national faculty here who have joined with us are dr bala subramaniam sir director for this cme course and workshop sir is our senior consultant thoracic surgeon yashoda hospitals secunderabad dr saiwal kanderwar sir who is working in max super specialty hospital new delhi we have dr bhushan tambeer sir from max institute of cancer care new delhi dr manjunath bhale sir from yashoda hospitals now earlier sir was associated with apollo hospitals dr jagdishwar gaut sir from american oncology institute hyderabad i would i would now take privilege to call upon our chair persons dr amresh matan patli sir hod ctvs nims hyderabad sir please join okay uh, i invite anita bhalla ma'am from hod ctvs chest hospital hyderabad ma'am please come sit i would like to call dr chinna babu sunkanawali sir surgical oncologist yashoda hospitals high tech city i would even invite dr hemant udaya raju sir our surgical oncologist here at yashoda secunderabad welcome sir ma'am so to start with our first topic for our today's workshop setting up a robotic thoracic unit i request hemant sir to deliver the gathering about it Good afternoon and uh, warm welcome to everyone. Welcome to Yashoda Hospitals. I am uh, Dr. Hemant. I head uh, the Department of Surgical Oncology and uh, Minimal Invasive Onco Surgery here. So, Dr. Bala is a good friend, and we are operating in the neighboring theaters. So, he has given me the the first and the most difficult task for today. As surgeons, we would love to operate. We would love to show our videos. It has given me a very abstract presentation, which is actually made. Uh, how would I say? I, mean, I, I had to go back and do a lot of reading, and I think have benefited a lot from it. I hope to share a few snippets from what I have learned about how to set up a robotic unit. We have all been operating on robots. We have all been doing vats, like as a natural progression. But then, uh, when you look back and see what exactly is required to get a program started so my uh, talk would be under a few uh, gross uh, these are the divisions that i would look at basically from the hospital standpoint of view what does it require to get a robo in from a surgeon standpoint of view how do we actually get up to be robotic surgeons next phase is how do we continue to grow as robotic surgeons and how do we train the next generation so broadly i would look at four major divisions about how do we go at yeah we all know the benefits of minimally invasive uh, onco surgery all these things are like we see in day in day out but it but does it really translate in terms of robotics are we very sure that we are doing the same in terms of what we do in open or vats or by the esophageal surgery or lung surgery and is it really benefiting the patients so there is significant evidence most of the data that i am quoting comes from the big man 
uh, Certfolio's uh, data from their um, uh, Birmingham Institute. And some papers published by Penn State and all have uh, basically gone through those. So if you look at it, the balance is tilting towards robotic surgeries. Outcomes wise, yes, it's same, better. Cost wise, yeah, we are getting there. We are somewhere nearby, I wouldn't say exactly we have uh, beating the curve when it comes to comparison of robotic costs with uh, open OVATs. Now, why robotics? As we all understand that there is a surgeon factor also which is involved in the outcome apart from the patient factor and the other disease factors and the technical expertise. Does robo really reduce our surgeon fatigue? Is surgeon fatigue a major reason for why the outcomes plateau at a certain level point, level of time? As surgeons we start growing, then we hit a plateau. Is the surgeon plateauing or is the result plateauing is something that we need to analyze. Probably down the line we would have a point where we we understand that the robo is getting us over our fatigue levels, overall plateau levels and taking the outcomes upwards. And definitely a shorter learning curve, I prove it through a few evidences later. As compared to VATS, yes, a robo learning curve is definitely shorter. So it also uh, the step over from open to VATS versus open to robo, definitely there is a uh, amount of evidence which is surgeon to enter into a robotics program. The evidence is evolving. VATS versus RATS, lots of papers about, I mean, which goes where. It looks like the learning curves are shorter. The various case series, the shortest one by Jang et al, I guess, is, is around six. Six cases is your average time that you require to basically uh, not exactly master, but be familiar with uh, uh, the robotic uh, VATS, robotic thoracic surgery. Some series go up to 32 as well. But you can say that the learning curve is somewhere around around 17 to 20 cases. There's a paper which looks at the inflection point where your comfort levels improve to the level that you're actually ready, improving your outcomes on every count. Uh, this talks about about 45 is the point where you reach a major inflection in your robotic outcomes. As compared to VATS, obviously uh, this is a skewed data because VATS is probably robo, evolution of robo is like technologically much superior to evolution. VATS has evolved over a time, it's not just the surgeons, the equipment has changed, instrumentation has changed. So it's not a very kind comparison I would say, but then definitely you can put the learning curve about one and a half to two times lesser as compared to watts. If it takes 20 here, it takes about 50 for you to reach the same event of uh, proficiency in becoming a good watt surgeon. So thereby a robo has an advantage. As we understand, uh, we only think about the clinical team as clinicians, but you need to basically look at the major admin component of setting up a robotic unit as well. In the OR, you need a good nurse, you need a trained anesthetist, apart from a good bedside assistant, a non-technical person who, who actually helps you around with that. This is a major key, I would say. This is a fact which is probably very underplayed. You require good technical and maintenance staff. But what you require most importantly is a good shared vision with your admins. If you are not aligned in the same direction as your hospital, as your admin, there will be challenges. If you don't match up, if your vision doesn't match up with that of the admin, there will be challenges. If you are too fast, the admin is slow, there will be challenges. If the admin is too fast, I don't want to use the word greedy, but if, if that are want to grow very rapidly and you're not matching that, then once again you have a challenge. Then metrics and who's doing it, credentialing. And like I said, we learn but we don't grow unless we take up a few challenges. So most important thing that we need to understand that it has to be patient-centric. patient, patient -centric. Your outcomes have to match what you've been giving in terms of an open or a VAT surgeon. And like I told you, it's very important for the individual and the institution to have a same same frequency, I mean, reasonably okay frequency. It's like a marriage. And uh, you need to basically give yourself a strategic goal. You'll say that, okay, I want to be the, the primary referral center in Hyderabad or in South India. You need to basically give your, yourself a goal in terms of institution and your goal needs to be revised. You need to have stated objectives and goals, otherwise you won't know where the program will drive you, whether you can drive the program or not. And an academic interest has to be primary, especially if you are a teaching hospital, even if it is a, a hardcore corporate hospital. It's your academic, uh, what do you call, interest is what takes you forward. That's exactly the reason why we are all here, I guess. A team, you need to have a good director driving the program and you need to have somebody to assist him. 
a good head nurse, a coordinator, manager, and an advisory board which consists of across the board. If I am here, it's because Dr. Bala has invited me. He he's a thoracic. He does thoracic work. I do predominantly GI gynec work. Some amount of uh, I mean, if you if we, if there's always a conflict. We we consider esophagus as ours. You would consider it as yours. But then yeah, so there's a crossover. But it basically you need all the all the robotic surgeons on board along with the admin form a good team and this team has to go on reviewing what you are doing you need to have defined metrics monthly quarterly in terms of patient outcome in terms of numbers in terms of what surgery is who is doing and this has to be reviewed every quarterly every monthly and individually you need to look at a uh, patient data as well to see whether you are actually uh, delivering what you intend to do it's not just about the cost it's a more for our standpoint it's about the outcomes as well so the metrics are extremely important this is probably where we as clinicians probably take a back seat we get lost because we don't want to go into numbers but it's the numbers which actually take the program forward you would you would probably need a curve this is all Penn State data you would want your curve to go up like that you want your number of surgeons to increase per surgeon volume to increase, number of new departments to increase. So you would want your load. You see here, there's one or two departments sharing the load and as it goes up, there are multiple departments joining. So this is how a, a train, a good robotic program for you to be a good thoracic uh, robotic surgeon, you need the support of your colleagues as well. It's basically a teamwork because, I mean, you just can't take the lo load of, as a surgical oncologist or, or a, a gynecologist is using the robot. You basically need to Join hands with your colleagues to take the program forward. Everybody's numbers reflects your overall growth because the costs come down. As more number of surgeons use the robo, your costs come down, the patient is benefited, you are benefited. Otherwise, there's no incentive for you to actually take the program forward if you are sharing the load alone. Financial implications, I don't want to go into it because it's like it's crazy metrics here once again. So, so and what most important is who is a robotic surgeon? You need credentialing. This is the data that I have taken. Uh, the Da Vinci people, intuitive people were kind enough to share the data with me. So it's a four-step training process. The first step is very, where basically you have an interaction. They identify some potential in you. They look at your place and all that. So it's a basic interaction where you meet people and then understand whether the program suits you and you suit the program. Then you have the stepwise, then you need to basically go ahead and do a, a short online course. They'll credential you with that. And then basically there are three or four aspects. The main thing is the simulator work and the dry lab work. You, you need to put in about eight hours, which includes your docking, your uh, bedside, uh, uh, patient side uh, uh, maneuvers, and then uh, the surgeon console work, etc. And I mean, basically eight hours of dry lab and 30 hours on the simulator. And um, as for what data the Da Vinci people that I was discussing with them, they feel that I mean you need to basically have at least two or three surgeries ready by the time you commit yourself to your training. And they have certain metrics where they say that if you do a certain number of cases in a certain time frame immediately after you go for your training, then your program actually takes off. So if you go for a training and then you don't put that to use immediately, you probably slack down as a robotic surgeon and you're basically go back to what you are comfortable with either with WADS or with LAP or open or whatever. So you basically need to schedule your work as you take your training. So you plan ahead as well. Right. And then the third part is where basically you start doing your work. Uh, and then uh, basically you basically work on the porcine models under the guidance of a proctor. Proctor is a key here. I mean, the proctor is a person who hands hold, hand holds you till you, I mean, walk a little further in your journey. And uh, working on porcine models and your proctor comes over to guide you through your first few cases. Like the, there is no definition about how many cases have to be proctored. That's what I was, I was actually looking, trying to look at data and spoke to these people, but they were not able to give me. Because certain surgeries, your curve is less. Certain surgeries, like thoracic surgeries, obviously your curve is very high. They don't have a set minimum, but they feel that at least the first two surgeries need to be proctored. Right? In Indian conditions, it works that way. But if you look at uh, Certfolio's data, I'll just come to it, and how exactly they handhold their residents in every step. Obviously, we can't achieve those metrics here. But then you need to basically have a good proctor walking you through the initial days. And the metrics they give is that uh, you need to do 10 surgeries in the first three months. That's when you actually start enjoying the robo and then you take the program forward. This is a key metric here. 
if you wish to go ahead then there is a phase 5 uh, where it's a one on one mentoring where you want to fine tune as a colorectal surgeon supposing you're doing an anterior resection then you go to do a, a even even better uh, ultra low or something like that so that's a one to one thing which is not a part of the regular training but it comes in a little additional this all this is what you require to basically be a robotic surgeon this entire process probably takes you about 45 days or 60 days is the the program and uh, I guess it costs about, I'm not very sure, about $1,000 or something like that. In Indian, there are two centers, I guess, in India, which is uh, which are offering. One is in Kochi. I'm not sure where the other one is. Hopefully, with Dr. Bala's initiative, we'll have one here soon. Uh, and then, coming to core robotic uh, thoracic surgery, what exactly is the difference? Robotics, basically, like simulator work, animal models, and uh, video based, uh, the advantage of robotic uh, probably with VATS is the same but robotic thing gives you a better uh, visualization in terms of the you have a uh, higher quality videos where you can look up and the teaching material is much more uh, what uh, I would say more refined if not say more in terms of volume and it's recommended to do a stepwise progression when you're starting your robotic program. Uh, this is once again data coming from uh, Certfolio's team in which they say you predetermine what steps you want to do in your initial cases. You want to put only the ports, you want to dock, go out and do your VATS or, or do an open, fair enough. You predefine what steps, still what do you want to? Do you want to go ahead with mobilization? Do you want to go ahead with mediastinal dissection? You want to do a venous vein dissection or you want to go ahead and do an artery? You predetermine in your first few cases, don't strain yourself with the burden of the entire procedure. Split it down. Stepwise, you walk through your procedures. Take a few cases where you do only a part of the surgery. Then you go down to your uh, open or wads or whatever you're comfortable with and rest, finish the rest of the procedure. That is a very crucial key uh, which they have uh, uh, quoted. And then choose your surgeries as per the level of difficulty. Don't directly start off with a very difficult procedure. Start off with a, a mediastinal, uh, small mediastinal procedure or working in the posterior uh, uh, posterior mediastinum, taking up a small wedge resection, mediastinal cyst, then slowly progress over to a bigger procedure like a lobectomy or a segmentectomy. So choose your grade of procedures and choose what you want to do in your initial days as a robotic surgeon rather than trying to take the strain and the burden of an entire procedure, even if your proctor is around with you. Like we have discussed the volumes, so they have compared head-on-head -head robotics versus uh, VATS and they feel that for established surgeons, for people who are already trained robotic or trained VAT surgeons, if they move on to robo, when they start doing lower lobectomies, there's not much of a difference. Upper lobectomies, probably there's some difference, but there's not much of a difference. So it takes about yeah, around 20 cases uh, is what it takes to transition into a good robotic surgeon for a, a trained VAT surgeon. And this is the program in which they split the procedure into different steps, give you the time in which you actually have to perform with a proctor guiding you. Depending upon the step of the procedure, you are given this much time and then you can actually look up and then do that procedure, take that amount of time, probably a little more, little less. These are things, these are like what targets that you need to set yourself before you progress to do a, a big procedure, complete procedure. Right, and they look. There is this study, which this is the study in which they have the least uh, what what do you call the learning curve. They have looked at uh, initial robotic, long term VATS outcomes versus somebody who's just picking up VATS. So they have compared head on to somebody who's going to a robotic program to a VATS program to an established uh, VATS surgeons. They feel that overall robotics is superior. There are no conversions. Okay, there are not much conversions to open. But, I mean, over time was shorter, obviously, with uh, current VATs as compared to initial VATs. So, someone going to robo initially versus someone going to VATs initially, a robotic thing is slightly superior. Obviously, post-op and all that, these are established centers, so obviously their morbidity data would be very less. When it comes to training residents, is it really dangerous to train residents on robo? A lot of, this is once again data from the US, so we can't extrapolate it here. All of them who came out with a, a proctored proper program for thoracic surgery felt that they were very short in in robotic thoracic that applies to I think all aspects of uh, fellowship training there 
But if you look at the overall data, where only residents were doing, there's absolutely no change in operative outcomes. Whether a senior is operating or a resident is operating in those matured systems, it's actually safe. The reason I put up this slide is because we always tend to question, now when you learn robotics, you become a resident. So how safe is it for a resident to do a thoracic robotic as compared to you as a consultant doing a, you, whatever you're familiar with, you won't be harming the patient. Th that is what data proves you. So that question always comes up. Am I harming the patient? Should I just do what I'm comfortable with? If you have reasonable experience, then you require those 15, 20 cases with some amount of support, some amount of planning, you'll be a good thoracic surgeon. So I would end here. I don't want to take a lot of time. We'd, I would like to watch videos of all of you here. So I would like to conclude saying it's a good time to get into robotics. So I think we should take that step forward. Thank you, Dr. Bala. Thank you, Dr. Herman, for that. Uh... Any questions? Any questions from the audience? Myself being an uh, open uh, thoracic surgeon, uh, I just need to know, uh, do I, as if I'm a resident who's just joined a, a program and I don't know open surgery, open thoracic surgery, uh, am I safe enough directly to go there uh, about the conversion? I mean, you had the last slide, that's what made me thinking. In a mature setup, yes, madam. Okay, but I mean, then there's backup to do a VATS or open by somebody else. That's exactly. What I mean, if you're in a very proper, matured setup, uh, in, a, in a good institute where you have good backup, so, and it's in the US and all, uh, it's everything is like you have an attending with them. So a resident is operating, it's practically every step, every, that handheld by the, because uh, I have worked with Dr. Kushid Guru, he would sit and he would say, okay, what side did you do? He was a prosthetic, uh, basically, he was a pioneer in prosthetic surgery. He say, did you operate on the right side last time or the left side last time? So if you have done the right dissection last time, he'll say, okay, you, I'll, you do the left one, I'll do the right one. So in a matured program, a resident is like, probably he'll do a little better job than, than all of us seniors. Yeah, because they're already seasoned into it. <laughs> No, uh, because, I mean, in our system, it is a little uh, I know. difficult because and if you have to convert, you should be uh, very safe enough to do a thoracic surgery on your own than directly going to a True robotic matter. program. Yeah. That's my comment so, about uh, it. For a, for a senior experienced surgeon to move into robotics is easier than a resident. Correct. But if the resident is working in a mature, safe system where there is a lot of backup, probably... And this is Western data. We don't generate our own data. So in our own hands, I think we should say currently that probably it's not safe. But if there is someone to watch your back, then probably it will be. Yeah. Any questions from the house, please? I think then we'll move on to the Thank next you. discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your thoughts with us. Now, I would, uh, moving on to our next topic, robotic operational module. Um, I would request Mr. Abhirup Paul from Initiative Surgicals to come and present about this.
just take it out once. One second. Yeah. Let's go press it. Yeah. Which one? <laughs> but I have a video over here which needs to be connected to the internet. Oh. And this internet is not working. Ah, it is working. No, it's not. The video is not playing. I have connected to my phone. Oh. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think sorry for the technical uh, problem with the laptop. <coughs> uh, so today, uh, so my, I will introduce myself. I'm Abhirup, and I take care for the clinical and the training part for Intuitive, and I'm based out of Hyderabad. 
so today we will speak about the robotic operational module of basically in a in a common terms how does a robo work so before we go to how does uh, exactly a robo work let's first see where does robotic surgery stands on the surgical space or the techniques that we have in the surgical space as of now so obviously robotic surgery stands within the minimal invasive technique that we have apart from the open so how we define robotic surgery is basically it's a modif it's an extensive it's an extension version of conventional laparoscopy or where where exactly a patient is benefited from a robotic surgery is basically for the cosmetic results or a minimized blood loss the surgeon has an enhanced vision while operating a surgeon's fatigue as dr hemant already mentioned and then we have already a reduced infection rate in a robotic surgery for the uh, for the reason is there is minimal uh, the number of ot staff that is required is is the minimal number or the hospital stay is drastically reduced obviously we have had uh, we have had data on the pain score of robotic surgery in which we have a drastically reduced pain score and overall in turn what benefits the patient is to return to normal activities let's go to the first thing like what what exactly is a robotic surgery or who does the surgery so the basic thing what goes on when when robotic was very new like is the robot does is the robot that does the surgery so probably it's absolutely not the robo is just a machine the surgeon is in control and hence the surgery is being performed completely by the surgeon so what does a surgeon do in a robotic surgery is basically a uh, he uh, the surgeon sits on the surgeon console views the anatomic views the anatomical site through a high definition 3d view they have the master controls on the surgeon control which basically are controlled by the surgeon and the same controls are replicated by the da vinci system uh, for the maneuverability of the instruments in to to the ultimate goal of complete uh, to achieve the ultimate goal of 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 a of a better patient outcome in the entire surgery let's take a few data of how robotic has evolved over the over uh, the period of time uh, we have had almost 10 million da vinci robotic surgeries around the world as of 2021 as of the 2022 data goes we have almost crossed more than 11 million uh, again this data is from 2021 so every 18.6 seconds a, a patient is being operated on a da vinci system uh, intuitive being a pioneer into the field of robotic surgery have had developed the all the systems right from generation 1 to generation 4 and hence this is how the development has progressed which actually has benefited lot of surgeons in terms the finally to give better outcome to the patients so what we have as of now are the gen 4 systems they are the xi the x and the sp system is obviously which is not available in india we have xi and the x system available and operated and operative in india Uh, and yeah we do also have a few si systems all around india as of now uh, but yeah we are trying to progress everything to the fourth generations now uh, let's come to the parts of a robotic of of the robotic system is basically a entire robotic component consists of three individual components they are basically the surgeon console where the surgeon sits and operates the other part is the vision cart so the vision cart is basically contains a monitor the arbe bio generator the system core or the system electronics which is basically the main cpu or the processor of the robo and obviously we have a video connector where the endoscope connects to the video controller so the surgeon console and the vision cart are basically the non sterile units and they need not and the surgeon need not be completely sterile to operate on 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 these two components but now the patient cart is basically the only sterile component as it is docked within the patient now let's go through a small video 
so this will give you an idea of how the entire da vinci system works this is basically the xi patient card this are the instrument arms and all the arms are 8 mm arms which are compatible to 8 mm instruments this is the surgeon console so you see these are the master controllers through which the surgeon basically controls the entire robot these are the endorsed instruments and this is how typically a endorsed instrument works so we call it as the boom rotation and it has a 270 degree rotation that's the 8 mm 3d endoscope uh yeah so that so that was actually to give you a fair idea of how the all the three components of the robo looks like and how they synchronously work together so majorly all of so the major audience over here i guess are all surgeons and hence i thought this would be a good idea to give everybody an idea about the surgeon console components looks like a lot of thing within the surgeon console but yes the surgeon has the autonomy to control everything like the sit on their cars So what we see over here are the IR sensors on top within the 3D viewer, which are sensors that detects whether the surgeon is on the surgeon console and looking onto the anatomical field. The 3D viewer is basically to give a 3D image of the anatomical field of the anatomical field. Then we have ergonomic controls. So the ergonomic controls are basically helps the surgeon to to as to completely set the entire surgeon console as per their own. comfortable modules then we have the armrest in which we basically have an arm because what we do in how we mainly do a robotic surgery is with the usage of our wristed hence we call it as wristed movements while doing a robotic surgery then we have the pedals as you see we so the surgeon has the control of the camera the surgeon has the control of the swap pedal the surgeon has the control of the energy pedal as well as the power button we have a clutch pedal that basically works more like a car clutch to 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 as a, to to basically uh, when your master controls are a, a little bit way forward to bring it on position we use the clutches and obviously we have the touch pad through which the surgeons can can control the entire settings so what us what a da vinci system provides the surgeon is a complete autonomy and they need not at at all at at any times even if they do not get a proper assistant the surgeons can give the same same quality of results to a patient uh let's see what a surgeon achieves by it it has 7 degrees of freedom which means a surgeon has more range of motions which is obviously greater than the human hand and a 90 degree articulation and a 540 degrees of rotation uh this is something interesting that is within the da vinci system is a remote center technology so a remote center is the black band that i have marked it out and it is placed at a neutral location so the remote center is usually within the cannula and it is placed within a neutral location within the patient's body wall and this basically functions as a fulcrum to rotate the robotic arms 
so what what does the significance of the remote center is it drastically reduces the port site pains uh let's see how a typical robotic instrument works i have given a small video of it uh, this is somebody who have not seen how a robotic endo wristed instrument works this is how precisely a surgeon can move the endo wristed movements as you see we have wristed endo wrists so every bite you take on a suture which is a is with a greater and a higher precision so this is how i have shown about the endo wrist instrument how they function now let's come to a few datas that i would like to so show you about how has been the progress of surgical or different specialities of surgery with our, with the da vinci robots and obviously we have progressed from a first gen to second gen to a third gen to a fourth gen robo now and this is how every speciality has taken a, has has taken a leap uh yes we have had thoracic taking up a leap right from 2014 uh but this is something which we got a very interesting data of the number of lung lobectomies that have actually increased from 2014 onwards while we have got our fourth generation systems coming to the fourth generation systems and which is very much specific i guess for all thoracic surgeons is to have a complete autonomy of the entire system hence the entire system is being bundled up with all the specific technologies that we have over here which drastically gives the surgeon a much greater autonomy in order to attain better better results for the patient so we are into lot of specialties that can be operated with a single da vinci robo and as dr emanth was emphasizing how to build a Uh, a robust robotic program by involving as many specialities as possible so to get a summary of how yes robotic is one of the surgical options uh, the components of a robotic surgeon of of a robotic surgery systems are the surgeon console the patient cart and the vision cart the specialties involves a wide variety of specialties and in order the ultimate goal is to give a better outcome to the patient so how a typical robotic ot looks like for you all and i am ready to take questions if anybody has uh sorry what is the difference between xi x and sp uh so xi is so all are fourth generations the sp is a single site uh, robo it's not a multi port robo it's a single site it's a single incision robo so it's basically not it's basically for single incision it's not for multi port so what hope hope i have answered i'm clear no, no the other part is difference between x and xi okay so xi is the latest version or the highest version among the fourth generation that we have the xi we have a change within the patient cart in which the xi is basically that the in a if i take on a traditional robo how the patient cart is docked on a patient is that the patient cart is brought in from from the target anatomy and and docked from the patient by bringing on from the target anatomy 
now what on the, on the xi what we have is that the we have a boom rotation which basically orients itself once we feed the data on the patient cart it orients itself and positions itself on the target anatomy as as the data is feeded so it's a little bit of more higher generation or or i would tell a higher technology the xi is a fourth generation but it has limitations of not having a boom rotation but the instruments and everything are all same what is the average size of operation theater that your company recommends to have a robot uh, it's it's we, we 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 don't have a hard and fast of a operation it's the normal ot theaters that is required so general ot is how much big we have is the same one Any other questions? Thank you so much, uh, Abhirup, for a uh, wonderful sir. presentation. Thank you so much. presentation is there somebody's no yeah wait this i can cut so much where is another Thank you, Mr. Abirup, for your valuable information to the gathering. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Bhushan Tomber, sir, for our next topic: robotic thymectomy, robotic diaphragmatic plication. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Balasubramanyam, uh, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to give a talk on robotic thymectomy and. Uh, diaphragmatic plication i know 15 minutes uh, would be too short for this uh, big presentation but i will try to cover everything and uh, almost the brief uh, sort of so ashton and colleagues first report to uh, have done total robotic approach to thymectomy in 2003 so that old is this approach right sided approach was popularized uh, because it is a bigger uh, chest cavity uh, and superior visualization of innominate and the svc Charity University in Berlin widely used three-trocar unilateral robot-assisted thymectomy placed along the submammary fold. Okay, so the thymectomy classification basically one should know before embarking on the journey for robotic thymectomies. That is like uh, trans-cervical thymectomy, video-assisted thoracoscopic thymectomy and transternal thymectomy and trans-cervical, transternal, some hybrid uh, thymectomies. And nowadays uh, we are doing sub uh, thymectomies. So, depending on the patient characteristics, myasthenia gravis, no thymoma, transcervical thymectomy can be done, the thym thymus gland is very small. Uh, it can be done, no wax thymectomy, robotic thymectomy, and even uh, transternal thymectomy, depending on the surgeon's expertise. So, uh, depending on, the NC, uh, uh, as we have evolved over uh, from wax surgeon, open surgeons to wax surgeons and to robotic surgeons, now we are uh, removing more and more bigger tumors uh, uh, either in a hybrid way or in a pure robotic way. So 
the best advantage for robotic surgery is better visualization and wristed instruments. Even the larger thymic tumors, we can dissect them out uh, via robotic and deliver them out to via the subzephoid incisions or a little lateral thoracotomy incisions. Uh, now indications, all myasthenia gravis with thymoma, generalized myasthenia gravis, double seronegative myasthenia gravis, benign malignant thymic tumors, and definitely, as Robert Serfolio has mentioned, uh, experienced robotic surgeon is one of the indications. So contraindications, these are all related contraindications. Invasion of the great vessels of the heart and a very large tumor size, more than 13 centimeter as the literature says. So everyone should know this uh, composite anatomy of uh, thymus gland by heart, where we have found the ectopic locations of uh, thymus gland, when especially when we are dealing with myasthenia gravis, all this uh, fibro fatty tissue along from uh, left to right phrenic nerve, uh, from left to right internal mammary vessels and from substructural nerve, till the sub zephoid uh, region all fibro fatty tissue has to be removed especially in cases of myasthenia gravis so what is preoperative evaluation apart from history physical examination pulmonary function test cardiac stress testing there is a important role of contrast enhanced computed tomography of the chest we have to assess the innominate vein uh, additions any svc uh, or any loss of fat planes between the mass and the vessels or pericardium uh, uh, and apart from these all uh, technical aspects, we have to give due respect to the, uh, the neurologic assessment whether patient is having myasthenia gravis uh, uh, or not, whether any serologic antibodies are there, anti-acetylcholine receptors or anti-musk antibodies are there or not, and electrophysiologic evaluation. So, wait. Uh, so always uh, whenever we are embarking on a robotic thymectomy, uh, we, ha uh, we have to keep wax instrument ready, sternotomy set ready and checked up on the trolley and there has to be consent for robotic as well as wax as well as open should be taken and explained in detail. So I will explain uh, robotic thymectomy in context with a case. This is a 34-year-old gentleman, came with cough into three months, PET CT uh, showed a 6.8 into 4.8 into 8.8 centimeter mass in anterior mediastinum with low FDG uptake. ct guided biopsy was uh, type B1 thymoma, no myasthenia gravis and no comorbidities. So this is the PET CT where we can see there is a la pretty big adequate large size mass with uh, fat planes well preserved. So this is the CT picture you can see. This is a contrast enhanced image where we can see clearly the planes of separations are there. So for this case, we have decided left-sided double lumen uh, tube, a single lumen with CO2 insufflation can also be used with 8 to 10 mm Hg of uh, CO2 pressure at flow rate of 10 to 20 liter per minute. Total intravenous anesthesia, a central line, arterial line and a Foley's catheter. Uh, patient positioning is in this way, uh, uh, the hand, left hand is, uh, I used a left sided approach, although I, uh, I have used right sided approach also, it depends on the where the tumor bulk is there, if the tumor bulk is more on the right side, definitely you can also take the right sided approach also, and you can take the subsified approach as well, so left hand should be lying low and it has to be hanging, special care to be taken, no undue stretch on the brachial plexus should be there. So ports, these are the ports, uh, whenever we are embarking into robotic thymectomy, we do uh, a first port into the fifth intercostal space, do a diagnostic thoracoscopy, uh, see for the uh, feasible anatomy and this thing, then the second port is in the third intercostal space, uh, anterior axillary line, and the fourth port is in the uh, mid-clavicular or the anterior axillary line, and an assistant port can be added additionally. So this is the do docking of uh, robot Da Vinci XI system where we have already done our diagnostic thoracoscopy and determined our ports and this thing when we are 100% sure that we are going to proceed then only we dock the robot. We can uh, rotate the boom. Generally most of the times I use only uh, two arms, one Maryland and a grasper or sometimes scissor and a uh, grasper and the fourth, uh, third arm is in the camera. So 
this is what uh, uh, after diagnostic thoracoscopy you can start dissecting uh, here I will mention since this was known as a uh, type B1 thymoma if suppose it was more upgraded version type B2 or B3 definitely I wouldn't have a, uh, removed these additions I would have directly stapled the lung along with the uh, specimen so this is the dissection along the uh, left phrenic nerve we take all the fibro fatty tissue this is obviously a 2x mode faster video we remove uh, scrape all the peri uh, thymic tissue from the pericardium by blunt dissection and uh, cautery, monopolar cautery. In the initial days, uh, I used to use uh, monopolar Maryland forceps. Then uh, along the arch of aorta, we dissect. Then left phrenic now we have to demarcate, carefully dissect it out. Then we have to look for the, we are separating it out from the left phrenic now, everything. It is a mixture of blunt and sharp dissection. Now we are at the level of innominate vein where we can see the innominate vein. Now we will be encountering the uh, thymic veins, left and right thymic veins. This is the left horn of thymus which you are doubly clipping and cauterizing and then cut. then always you clip and cut so we can see one uh, thymic vein is here carefully dissecting across it so that uh, we get a whole circumferential axis doubly clip it and divide it and remove all the fibro fatty tissue bear the arch of aorta this thing in left sided approach sometimes we can see the right phrenic now as we uh, hear somewhere but if we don't see it and you know definitely you are not operating for myasthenia gravis you need not venture or else just a simple 5mm camera from the right side uh, you can do a wax guided or assisted uh, uh, left sided robotic thymectomy I will just fast forward it a bit. So right on. Then removing it from and then the endo bag and removing it out. And checking for hemostasis. So patient extubated on table, shifted to recovery, then ward after 3 hours, chest drain removed on next day, discharged on second post-operative day. Histopathology confirmed type P1 thy thymoma, patient on routine follow-up. So these are the various specimens. Sometimes the specimen is big, you have to put a the wound protector and remove it out. So what are the approaches? Uh, Right-sided approach, left-sided approach, uh, sub -zephoid. Nowadays, unipotal approach is becoming common. Complications are phrenic nerve injury, pericardial button hole injury or injury to the cardiac chambers, left innominate vein tear, especially at the junction of thymic veins and the SVC innominate vein junction. So key points are careful dissection along the phrenic nerve from side which you are operating. Opposite phrenic nerve to be visualized can be done by additional wax guided approach, skeletonization of left innominate vein, clipping of thymic veins, all fibro fatty tissue from suprasternal nostril zephoid and phrenic to phrenic dissection. Phrenic nerve injury if identified intraoperative additional diaphragmatic placation to be done in same sitting. Part of pericardium to be removed in case dealing with thymic carcinoma infiltrating the pericardium. Adherent lung to be wedged out in case dealing with higher grade of thymoma and malignancy. Thank you. This finishes our thymic uh, uh, presentation and now we will come for robotic uh, diaphragm placation. So indications are symptomatic diaphragmatic 
paralysis, uh, which have failed conservative management and iatrogenic phrenic nerve injury or identified intraoperative, especially during thymectomies and diaphragmatic eventrations. Contraindications are patients with uh, high body mass index more than 35 who can benefit by lay weight loss surgery or bariatric surgery, definitely which uh, a uh, diaphragmatic procedure can be avoided. Progressive neuromuscular disorders where, uh, where the outcome is totally uh, depend uh, systemic disease, bilateral hemidiaphragmatic elevation and calcified are non-pliable diaphragm. So, uh, in general, a short uh, diaphragm anatomy, the central tendon and various apertures for the uh, uh, the IVC, is, uh, IVC and other uh, blood vessels. So this is a central umbrication technique where we play, uh, pleat the diaphragm in a special uh, suturing fashion. This is how we suture uh, the diaphragm with uh, non-absorbable suture materials. Uh, this is from anterior to posterior. Radial plication technique. Uh, this was used previously older technique where we used to do thoracotomy and uh, plicate the diaphragm. So diagnosis and preoperative incident, it is generally most of the times incidental finding on a chest radiograph. PFT shows diaphragmatic dysfunction or reduced chest wall compliance and this uh, restriction worsens when supine. A posterior lateral and lateral chest radiograph is necessary. Fluoroscopic screening or sniff test is necessary for demonstrating this problem. And CT scan of the chest and the neck to look for any tumors or anything in the neck which is uh, uh, causing this injury. This is the patient position for the left, right sided uh, diaphragm uh, paralysis. This is the robot docking video. Uh, this is a Da Vinci uh, X plat platform uh, where we uh, dock the robot from the side, from the below end, not from the head end. So these are the ports. The first port we make at the uh, angle of scapula and then we uh, that is uh, uh, almost at the fifth or sixth, uh, sixth intercostal space and then the second port uh, in the anterior uh, mid axillary line or the anterior axillary line in the sixth intercostal space and the third port we make in the eighth intercostal space so approximately five to uh, ten, uh, eight centimeter from the port one and a, a extra uh, assistant surgeon port can be made. The, you can see from the diagram the the robot docking is from the leg end sideways. So this is the how we suture the diaphragm. This is a patient with the right diaphragmatic uh, paralysis. The liver has come up and this is a post-operative x-ray after correction. This is a demonstration video where we see always uh, while doing the robotic diaphragmatic plication, you have to lift the diaphragm and see, lift the diaphragm and suture it because there are intra-abdominal organs lying be beneath it. Uh, you sh one should not injure uh, them, otherwise you may land in trouble. So lift the diaphragm and then pass the needle, always. Non-absorbable sutures. And then uh, robot is especially helpful for tying the knots intracorporally. So multiple pleats can be created. And the final outcome will look like this. So this was another case of uh, left-sided hemidiaphragm paralysis. This is the hypercorrection in uh, immediate post-operative period and after 10-15 days this is the outcome. So complications, general complications of any thoracic surgery like atrial fibrillation, pleural effusion and overall is especially in diaphragm plication higher risk is of intra-abdominal organ injury and patient should not have excessive cuffing in post-operative period that will cause a recurrent diaphragmatic elevation. The other methods are double pulse string suturing uh, method and stapled excision of lax uh, portion of diaphragm. Uh, although it is mentioned, I don't recommend uh, because uh, uh, you are definitely uh, making the diaphragm portion viable uh, theoretically and robotic assisted abdominal approach can also be uh, used. The only uh, goal of diaphragmatic plication is to manage dyspnea. Surgery is warranted exclusive for symptomatic patients. So, uh, techniques are central imbrication technique, radial plication technique and robotic 
assisted platform is feasible with advantage of endo suturing and wristed movements of instruments thank you if there is time i will show you another video uh, dr bhushan yeah you, <coughs> you gave a run of money to shankar bahadevan's breathless yeah yeah because the, <laughs> the, the, so many slides were there i had to fit them two presentations definitely and uh, this thymus was from the left side uh, if we can this is a uh, one of the mediastinal tumors we recently started doing uh, uh, this thing can you show one quick question one quick, yeah. when uh, in your thymectomy yeah. the complications which you said may yeah. arise yes. how do you manage them yeah definitely i have got a video uh, after this uh, session i will show the video where i have injured the uh, innominate vein branch left branch and then immediately you have, should have cigars kept inside uh, see like this cigar you have to make and keep inside your thorax so you have to just press with uh, your grasper there till that time you, you think over and uh, your assistant is ready then we have to definitely always wax instruments and uh, sternotomy has to be available in the theater and definitely the consent has to be ready and all, all the plans and uh, ct scan should be discussed with your anesthetist and your assistant surgeon in detail before embarking the case where, are there any additions near the innominate vein svc where there are chances where i can have a vascular injury where i will need to open so everybody on the your team should be on the same page so it becomes a risk free surgery most probably and how much blood do you use generally thymectomy is clean cut thymectomy you don't require any transfusions ah uh, if it is a redo or something like that definitely then post radiotherapy post chemotherapy then definitely there is definitely blood loss and how much time yeah initial days definitely i took 3 or 4 hours but uh, with simpler cases now this is a case where uh, we have removed one uh, mediastinal tumor from the right side unipotal robotic surgery this was uh, hardly around 2 hours where planes were very clean and this thing yeah expert assistant is required definitely that saves a lot of time <laughs> excellent presentation any yes. questions from the audience in terms of port placement yeah yeah so uh, nowadays uh, i am doing more of uniportal so that in nominate vein area yeah dr bhushan yeah uh, that was a hi dr abhishek ah. that was a wonderful presentation which yeah. suture have you used in plication was uh, it ethibond ethibond okay. polypropylene and uh, felt plegets mm -hmm. ethibond ethicon Felt you plegets. get plegets you yeah. get yeah so is there any other option uh, alternative if not ethibond then uh, proline but pro proline problem is that the suturing becomes uh, difficult i have attempted with proline and mm -hmm. struggled almost one hour that it gives used to get loose Uh, you're not uh, is then you have to recut it again ethibond at least it has a grip right yes okay and uh, my assistant can always pass a suture passer uh, through the utility incision and then he can uh, tie the knots outside and pass them inside right thank you thank you any other thank you for an excellent thank presentation i think we'll move to the next uh, presenter please thank you at the outset uh, let me admit uh, and all the delegates who uh, who took that uh, i am out to attend the meeting uh, and also special thanks to all the all the faculty uh, for all, all the chairpersons yeah so I, i'll be i'll be presenting on robotic lobectomy in in a malignancy uh, so with my acha adu will go straight into the talk Uh, so the as uh, a case history of a of a 62 year old female who had an instantly detected right lower low, low lobe uh, speculated mass lesion uh, as you can see the the, the lesion is pretty speculated 2.6 into 2 cm uh, it was negative to pft and some minor restriction and it showed a, a stage of 1a3 uh the the echo was pretty, pretty normal and, and the plan was to do a, a robotic right lower lobectomy with a lymph node dissection
so uh, so the as uh, the uh, usual port planning that I have shown for, for or a four port technique so here you can see if you look at the picture you can see the four ports marked out here with, with, a, with a anterior working port uh, yeah the, the anterior working port is there in the, in the seventh in, in the causal space so all the ports are, have been put here in the seventh in the causal space you, you can see the anterior port you can see the cam, uh, camera port uh, somewhere behind the posterior axial line the mid scapular line and the port Scapular line. Here, the the inter port distance here, uh, as portion was referring to, is around eight centimeters. So you, you you can see that the distance between the these ports will be eight centimeter. If if, if it's less than that, you find that the ports tend to clash. Uh, and uh, here you see the distance from the utility to each port is seven centimeters. So so that al allows a be, be, be it a freedom for or your, uh, the, the surgeon at the operating table to keep uh, helping you be, 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 with the uh, actioning and also the stapling. Now uh, the uh, the inter port so so now when you go for four ports you have to be sure that at your posterior on port is at least five millimeters away from the spine or, or the your space becomes too narrow if, if you go towards the spine and a lot so at least a five millimeter distance there is mandatory so now we, we have moved from um, uh, uh, for, for O-port technique to a three-port technique uh, so there the deploy I think mean, becomes a bit more easier you are drawing the posterior axial line here you just mark your anterior like spine tip of the shoulder you mark your posterior axial line you find the tip of your scapula uh, it's a pretty obvious little lady so I'm, uh, I'm having a bit of, bit of trouble palpating the you know the, the the landmarks. So you see the tip of the scapula here. We have marked the intercostal margin over here. I'm 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 trying to I'll pay the last uh, I'll probably rub here in the posterior axilla in the at I assume to be to to be the tenth rib and from there we mark out your ninth rib, uh, eighth rib and the seventh rib and the corresponding intercostal spaces. So then you identify either your seven space or your six space or the eight space depending on the lobe you are on to approach. So now normally I go a bit higher. So even if it's a low, low, low lobe, my, my ports will be in the seven space. If it's a upper lobe, maybe I may, may be putting the, the ports in the six space. So we, we, we mark the uh, the camera port out of the posterior axial line. We, um, we measure eight centimeters on either side. Mm -hmm. have, have the two working ports on either side. We see we mark seven seven centimeters. We we me measure seven centimeters from the camera port and from the anterior port and place the U U utility incision somewhere there. So that completes a port planning. So you, you have your utility here, you have an anterior port here, so something like an arm one, you have the arm two, you have the camera here, and in arm, arm three, you have your second instrument. So we uh, start off, so once our uh, ports are placed, yeah, before putting up, Ports we infiltrate lo local anesthetic. We now we, we either you can you can do local infiltration at the points of ports, or, or you can do block, blocks from three to eight. Um, we have identified the the area of the lesion there in the, in the right lower lobe. Uh, we go on straight to the uh, to identify the inferior pulmonary ligament. Um, we trace the inferior pulmonary ligament up to the inferior pulmonary vein. You can see here the right inferior pulmonary vein there. What all lymph nodes we see on the, the, the way? Like I, I, seeing the upper esophageal lymph node there. All the uh, lymph, uh, 
inflows a systematically removed SPD mandate in a malignancy. Our average lymph node count on robotics we have seen is higher than and we do VATS. Lymphonectomy is pretty simple in robotics when compared to VATS. We use a normal glove finger to to extract lymph nodes uh, and then and we go on to dissect around the inferior pulmonary vein there and uh, we we like uh, we are practically making space for our uh, for our uh, looping of the vein so you can see uh, so I'm so up carinal nodes in a way and we go on to remove those lymph nodes too and all the lymph nodes are preferably removed in packets and that's the carinal area So once this uh, up carinal area is also clear, we we have a lot of space, space to you know loop the vein and open up the area uh, around the inferior pulmonary vein. So it's a, it's a, it's safe to you know remove lymph lymph nodes first and then go on to you know loop the vessels because you have a lot a lot of space and the chance of injuries. Uh, pretty less and uh, once we have our our uh, looping done we change to our robotic stay a plus so so I'll just show how we do the, the, the robotic stay stay plus so to do robotic stay plus we have to change our 8 mm ports to 12 mm uh, and pass the robotics to A plus through the 12 mm ports. So if, if you see that the bottom here, you can see all the you know clamping and firing and uh, unclamping. So the robot determines if this A plus is suitable uh, and uh, how much thickness of tissue is there uh, and and what stay approach should be used where so they and we go on to start working on the <coughs> oblique fissure over here and uh, the uh, artery base uh, arching there for or the artery so the superior visualization of robotics in certain situations helps us to avoid stay a plus uh, our vision is so good, good that you can do a blunt isolation of the fissure and open it up. So we'll just go forward. forward. So now I'll be showing another eye lower lobectomy where I'll be starting with the you know looping of the artery. Here we are you using manual stay A plus here. Uh, so I, as you can see the technique is a bit different you loop the uh, vessel the vessel loop uh, and you utilize that that to you know manipulate the artery around uh, and when we use a manual stay epler it's the operating surgeon at the t t table who, who is firing the stay epler so um, we have, have to help whoever is on the console. The surgeon is actually helping the uh, the surgeon at the console to fire this stay able by manipulating the lung around. So and just going on and uh, and and you know uh, completing the fissure here. The the, the Fisher there and uh, going on to complete the bronchus in the end. So these are all manual stay A plus being used. 
So, so that completes the bronchial stapling uh, and you can see is a middle lobe bronchus over here. So it's mandatory to make sure your upper lobe and the middle lobe is expanding well after you clamp your right lower lobe bronchus. So as to be sure that the middle lobe is not involved in, in your stapler. So the specimen is back. Yeah, thank you. So that the uh, so so every every robotic procedure that team is very important pro providing you with the help on the table technical so, uh, support. So without a team, robotics is pretty tough to do. That was an excellent uh, uh, presentation, Dr. Bala. Any questions from the audience? Dr. Bala, pre fantastic presentation. Congratulations. Uh, just some very basic questions. Yeah. Uh, does your team which does the robotic, uh, is the support team the same for, say, the GI surgery, for uh, thoracic surgery uh -huh. and uh, urosurgery and other people? No, uh, we uh, we we don't have the, that luxury here. Uh, we uh, I have a team who assists me in every batch and robotics. So so we are used to you know coordinating amongst ourselves. So so ideally you have to have some something like a robotic OT team where. Uh, they they will be specialized to talking the raw about or, or you know uh, um, uh, passing the instruments uh, actioning state appling. So yeah, you have, have to build a team of your own. So you, you can't have a new nurse every day. You can't have a new OT tag every day. So from docking to port, port placement to docking to when you're on the console. A lot of people are helping you at the operating table, uh, actioning, removing the instruments. When you do a lobectomy, stapling, which is probably the most important step in a lobectomy, is being done by uh, your, your, your assistant surgeon there. So oh, now we have robotic staplers, where, where the surgeon at the console itself we will be able to control and, and use. So basically we are looking at, uh, in your team, we are looking at two sets of team. One who does the setting up of the robo with the instrumentation mm -hmm. and other things. And the other other set of people who are more familiar with the thoracic anatomy who uh, who help you with suctioning, stapler uh, uh, and others. No, no not really. So when we dock the raw, raw but I'll be there at the, at the uh, operating table. Once the docking is over, I'll shift to the console. So, so it's in that period that I, they help me with the stay, stay, stapler change, the instrument change, and the suctioning. So they have, they are basically on their own there. Basically, we here have a trained robotic nurse and a technician who handle the basic thing. And as per the operating team, your on-table assistants change. So when Dr. Bala operates, uh, his on-table assistants are from his team. When I operate, I have my residents or somebody. But the robotic nurse and uh, the robotic technician who set up are common. But on-table procedures, obviously he can't trust anybody else to put a stapler on that. I have another question. You know, uh, in my 20 years of thoracic surgery, I have never seen such a pristine lung. <laughs> How easy or difficult are additions to deal with? Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, no, uh, see, uh, ro uh, robo ro uh, robotics is easy to, to handle uh, additions unless they are really bad. Like, uh, see, it will patients where you, you can't uh, you, you can't enter into the ch 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 chest cavity. Uh, I prefer to do bats to do an uh, artificial uh, ice and then dog the robot. So, so I, I'm sure Shah Aival who who is do, 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 doing the ne and the next dog 
on, on lobectomy in, in inflammatory pathology, he will be showing how, how we will be handling additions in robotics. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balasubhramanam, sir. Due to our logistic and network, we are pre-poring Dr. Kelvin Lauser's uh, presentation. Now uh, we'll be having a Zoom call with Dr. Kelvin Lauser. So we are excited, we are going to start. Are you, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Are you going to hear yourself? Hi. 
announcing the hall to the audience. Hi, Dr. Elvin, hi. Uh, be able to see you here. Uh, can uh, and we start your talk? Can you go on to slide show? Yes. yes. Can you see my slide? Yeah, we are able to see your slides, yes. Good. Okay. Are you happy for me to start? Yeah, please start. Oh, okay. Um, thank you very much um, for inviting me um, today to talk about uh, the future trends of robotics. Um, I'm so sorry there's a clash in the program, so I can't be with you um, today. Um, so um, I, I just want to say that what the future trend is really not uh, is really not a trend in robotics as much as a trend of, of what we're responding to, because of course lung cancer these days. Uh, come from incidental nodules, from scans or other reasons, or because a patient has gone, uh, at least in, in where I work, because, to lung cancer screening. So when you get tiny nodules like this, so the nodules are getting smaller, so the operation will have to change, the operation modality have to change, and I'm going to see, um, you know, the, it, my colleagues in major therapy tells me a lot about how um, how they, 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 they are getting better and better with radio, radiotherapy so that they can, they, before they just irradiate everything, but as the tumors change, they evolve the technique so it become, becomes more and more precise. And if you look at 1990s, when I was a medical student, you know, they were doing lung cancer operations through this kind of cuts. If we think about decades, by 2000s, when I was, when I was a, a trainee in cardiothoracic surgery, they, started, they just started doing um, vast operations. Move on another 10 years, then we have uniportal surgery, and we're getting better and better with our techniques. So the question is, what is in uh, 2020s? And I'll let you, I'll let you uh, uh, decide for yourself, but I'll give you a few options. Is it robotic surgery, multiport robotic surgery? Is it uniportal robotic surgery with a multi-port robot? Is it uniportal robotic surgery with a uniportal robot? Or is it no port surgery without any decisions? So, all right, we'll come back to this. So we are very lucky we have a, um, in Bath, we have a dedicated thoracic surgery cardio uh, um, XI robot. So we do thoracic surgery five days a week. And um, so uh, we've, we've already, uh, I, I see that actually I'm, I'm talking to the converted because you're all very experienced robotic surgeons. And the problem with um, robotic surgery is that if we're having difficulty establishing that is it actually better than VATS. Certainly for lorectomy, there's a quite a difficult answer to, to, to question to answer. But remember I told you lung nodules have changed. Maybe we shouldn't be thinking about lorectomy. Maybe we should be thinking about segmentectomy. The Jacob study is, is shown that the overall survival and, uh, and recurrence, and this overall survival is better than with segmentectomy. And so for lesions less than two centimeters, we should be doing segmentectomy. Segmentectomy is not an easy operation. Not everyone can do it, especially by VATS. And this is, I think, where the robot, robot has um, has come. So this is our practice. This is the um, uh, in our department. Uh, and we were doing very few segmentectomies, and we've grown almost five times over the last three years to do a lot more. And so now we do a third of our anatomical lung resection by segment. So we do every segment we do um, uh, two lobectomy. In fact, that ratio has just changed this year. So we're doing more segmentectomy than lobectomy. And you can see here, by, if you look at the segment technically by VATS or by, by OPEN, the most of the, the increasingly almost all done by robotic because now the robotic surgery may not make much difference for VATS or for lobectomy, but for segmentectomy, it makes it much easier. So an example is this. This is one of my, this is one of a doctor in the hospital. She's got breast cancer. And when they did the staging CT, they found that she's got this lung nodule. And they say, oh, you've got stage four breast cancer. And because she's a doctor, she say, I don't believe it. I want to know what, whether this is or not. And, um, and so I did a, uh, my slide got stuck. Oh, so I did a, um, a, uh, a, 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 a,
uh, uh, navigation from Cosby and turned out to be carcinoid. And since she's got this one centimeter carcinoid, uh, uh, eight millimeter carcinoid, you can see it's between B8 and 9, so um, uh, B9 and 10, sorry. And um, and you can see the, uh, it's very convenient in 8, 9, and 10. They have a common trunk in the artery. And uh, in, the, in terms of the vein, there's also a common trunk 9, 10 uh, of the vein, V9 and 10. And, uh, and as well as the bronchioanatomy, there we go, so V9, 10 versus V8. Um, and, and also the bronchus, they've got a common trunk of 9 and 10. So uh, it's quite difficult. I think this is jumping quite a lot, uh, and I'm making this quite fast. So you can see that for us, I think one of the trends for robotic surgery, certainly in Europe, is it, it was difficult to get when it was just about lobectomy. It's difficult to convince people that there's any benefit and to, to go and do it. But now, a lot of centers are interested in doing um, um, robotic surgery because seg segmental dissection, dissecting so finely out to the segments, are much easier. And that's what we do. So that's... Um, uh, so that was the artery I just showed you here. We're dissecting the, the vein to find a, a, a V910. Um, and then I'm just jumping through this because it's a bit jumpy uh, on this computer. Uh, that's V910. And then here we're dissecting out uh, the B910. And you, you can just see um, a B, but well, we've divided it there, but there's B8. But you get the gist, you can see really the, uh, there you go, so you've got B910, you just make sure you've got B8 there, um, and you can, you, can, you can see very intricate anatomy. Okay, so that's, that's, that's with what we do. The first trend one, with the robot we do, the trend is to do more segmental operations, and I think that's where the strength of the robot is. Uh, and then, of course, this is the, um, the this is the robot that has dominated market the market for a very long time. But um, in the last year, a lot of many robots have come up. But look at these robots. So, for example, this is the Avatarix. It's a German robot. It has four arms, uh, and one console from coming from above on one swivel um, platform. It's got a IP sitting in for binocular vision inside immersive view. This looks remarkably like the XI, doesn't it? So, therefore, I am not sure what added value there is compared to uh, the XI. And then there are other multiple robots. So this is Hugo. Hugo has um, four arms, but they all come in individual carts. And they're not the only one, because uh, Transenteryx um, also does that. Uh, sorry, uh, this is Cambridge Medical Versius. And then Transenteryx Senhance also does it. These are all just breaking down the, the one single four-arm robot into four separate arms. They say it's more versatile, but I think actually you just make the footprint of the robot much bigger. So you, you've got less is more. We decided not just like getting smaller, surgery is getting more intricate. You want to remove less lung. Why are we making these bigger? So I'm not so sure. And of course, these new robots are different from the XI because none of them could fire a stapler. And for us, it is, makes no sense whatsoever to adopt another new robot just to put a stapler manually in. The most delicate part of the operation is an assistant who has no, you have no control of to fire a stapler in a segmental vessel. Not good. Uh, this is uh, the J&J uh, &J robot. It used to be called Vert. It's now Octave. It is now built onto the table. Uh, it has amazingly six arms. And uh, I'm not so sure why we gone from three ports surgery to biportal surgery to uniportal surgery. But in robotic surgery, you go from four ports to eight, six ports. So that also had me scratching my head for a bit. But probably the, 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 the thing that actually will make a difference that is going in the right direction is the SP, single port robot. So you can see here, I think the single port, port robot uh, from Intuitive, four arms going through one cannula, and, um, uh, and you see the arms coming out, and then they can cut and operate, triangulate. And I love this because it looks a bit like a mantis. Um, and uh, and you can therefore get 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 uh, go and do much. Uh, again, the problem with this at the moment is that it doesn't have a stapler, so for lung resection it doesn't work so well. But for mediastinal surgery, it would you know you can imagine doing mediastinoscopy with this. It would be brilliant. Okay, now we've talked about the two trends. One is to do more segmentectomy. Two is moving away from four ports to go to compete with uniportal um, uh, surgery. But what about no port? I mean, who needs a surgeon anyway? 
This is the, uh, uh, I mean, I'm bringing you back because this is a bronchoscopy, the bronchus conference. So this is the iron. This is another intuitive robot. So intuitive is really pushing the boundaries. And um, uh, with that tip, and uh, uh, they can, you can see, but you can also see that the catheter, the computer can sense exactly how this one catheter is moving, the way she's moving it. So with these two combined, You, it means that you can put this thing inside and it can navigate around the lung very accurately. It knows where it is with the shape sensing and you can drive it. So here, it's driving out towards a nodule. Yeah. So you can see it's moving. This is the left is the, where it should be going on the, on, the, on the plan and on the right is where uh, it's going. And this is, this is that other nodule I showed you, the lady with the castle nodule. You want to get me to this position. Now, as I explained to you before, who wants to cut out a whole load for 8 millimeter carcinoid? It's a shame to raise the whole load of lung. And so what if you could do this when you navigate out and you just burn away the lesion? She had, the patient had no incision and probably go home on the same day. This is what we're facing up with, is the future of thoracic surgery. When will this be useful? For example, in this situation. So this is a patient who was referred to me for colorectal metastasis. He has four nets, one in the right lower, second in the right lower, third, uh, um, third in the right lower here, and one on the left lower. So if how are you going to remove three wedges from the right lower, of which they are quite deep, and leave with anything but a useless piece of little bit of lung? So it doesn't make sense sometimes to do surgery. Another situation here, this is no patient with a colorectal metastasis. There's one here, right on the fissure on the left, against the fissure. So that's easy to find surgically. The other one is deep inside the lobe, exactly between all three segments. It's not like you can even do a segmentectomy. It's too deep for wedge for metastasis. So this is a good illustration of a good of, of, of uh, what having multiple tools can do. So I decided that the best thing is to do the bronchoscopic approach here, put a by bronchoscope, reach this lesion and ablate it, burn it away, and then turn the patient over and wedge the left hand side. So this is ablating on one side and the staple line on the other side one month after the procedure. Why am I showing this? I'm showing you this because, and, and the bronchial approach is going to be a big competing um, uh, technique to your resection and, the, uh, and there are certain lesions which are particularly suitable for that and is driven by a robot. So, in summary, I want to ask you now, looking at the future, we as surgeons facing with nodules that are getting smaller and smaller, is the future multiport robotic surgery? Multiport robot going through a single hole? the way Diego does it. Uniportal surgery goes through a hole as a single port. Or is it a robot that doesn't need an incision? You have to ask yourself this as a doctor, a surgeon, and as a patient. The future might even be even more high tech. It might that be that these be, that there's no there's not even an external robot. It's something that you inject inside, it climbs out and it's got all the tools to deal with the things it needs to do. That's looking very far ahead. But we as surgeons must evolve, must adapt, because that's where progress is made. Uh, this is my hospital. We are celebrating 900th year anniversary this year. Um, and I'm very excited because um, it, I, I feel very strongly that I might be working in an ancient institution that we are constantly strive to innovate, to adapt to the change of pathology, the change of patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge on your future of thoracic surgeries and how to get upgraded to our next level. Any questions? That was such a fantastic presentation. Uh, uh, we would all like to upgrade to the new models, of course. <laughs>
there are a couple of questions from my side. Uh, one is, uh, you have shown a slide where the survival with segmentectomy is actually better than that with uh, lobectomy. I, I can't. I can't actually hear very well. If someone could translate to me, uh, uh, exp uh, yeah, what, if there's a question, yeah. Yeah. So the uh, question was: uh, Is survival for segmentectomy equivalent to a lobectomy now? Is the um, the gold standard become a segmentectomy? Is that the question? So, so what would be your cry? criteria to uh, go, go and do a segmentectomy, what would be your criteria to go and do a lobectomy now? The, the main criteria is any lesions under 2 centimeter will try to do a segmentectomy. Long as there is a good margin. And when, as the, the more central the lesion gets, the, as the intersegmental plane comes to converge on the hilum, so as the, as the lesion gets more and more deep and central, then you might not get the margin from the intersegmental plane, then you might have to take the neighboring segment, or it might be a lobe. But it is, it is maybe one, it has to be less than two centimeter, and two, your segment has to give enough margin. So, so, so what would be the percentage where you would you, plan to go in to do a se segmentectomy and end up doing a lobe? Um, very, very rare. I would say less than 10%. You can predict which one you want to do beforehand, and usually you just go and do the segment. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, no, there's, there's, there's no conversion to lobectomy unless there's a problem. And that problem may be uh, you have, um, you, you've got, you, you devascularized the remaining segment. You've accidentally taken a, a, uh, an artery, for example, an aberrant lingular artery coming from the truncus. Uh, you didn't realize that you take the truncus and you devascularize the lingula, or the lobe doesn't expand afterwards because you've um, taken the wrong bronchus or distorted the bronchus. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, while we appreciate the beauty of the surgery so much, uh, we have to realize that uh, presentations like these tend to turn our principles on its head. So that's why accepting it is so difficult. Uh, for example, now we have so many of, uh, uh, it is so common we see that uh, there are intraluminal carcinoid lesions and the interventionists are just burning their way through the lumens and say, look, this lobe, uh, this is now disease free and the lobe is breathing so well, we have saved your lobe. Only for the patient to come back later with extra luminal carcinoid, which becomes so much more difficult to operate. And uh, if you look at the absolute long term, it, it is not so great. We would have gotten away with a sleeve resection probably. That is one. Uh, so secondly, uh, so, on similar lines, would you say that uh, if we have just removed a segment, maybe they might come back with a disease which is much more widespread and which might later require a bigger uh, resection? Because after all, the traditional, the traditional teaching of oncosurgery has been, thoracic oncosurgery has been, small lesion, it's not enough to just do a wedge unless it's for a, unless it's for a metastatectomy but you remove the entire lobe. That is, uh, those are the principles on which the surgeries were founded. Now, are you challenging that very, uh, that very principle on which uh, the surgery is based? It's important for us to know. Okay, yes, I agree, I, and I am. Um, so I'm going to answer your questions backwards. I'm going to ask, first answer your question, is sublobar resection adequate oncologically for uh, lung cancer. And the two randomized trials in the last year which really changed the, the, the picture. The first one is the JCOG trial. The JCOG trial randomized to less sub-centimeter, sub-two centimeter lesions to segmentectomy and lobectomy. The overall survival for segmentectomy is better. 
So there's no argument that oncologically they live longer if you have a segment. And that's important because if you live longer, you are more likely to get a second cancer and you need more lung left behind so you can resect the second cancer. The second randomized trial is the CalGB trial, which came out, uh, the, the, which was presented in IACLC, the International Association of Lung Cancer, a few months ago. They randomized patients with less than two centimeters to sublobar resection, which was about a half wedge resection and half segmentectomy. So the superficial lesions are done by wedge and the deeper lesions are done by segmentectomy. It showed that this makes no difference to the long-term outcome. And the important thing is compared, reason, compared to the, 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 um, the, the, the original uh, study, um, uh, in, uh, what was his name? Um, that ra the randomized trial for lobectomy versus sublobar resection in 1984, the cancers, we're now talking about sub two centimeter lesions. He didn't. And if you're bigger than two centimeter, his trial is correct. But for the sub two centimeter lesion, the two randomized level one evidence now say segmentectomy is better. So the second question is regarding um, uh, carcinoid tumors, the respiratory decision to a but debulking. I'm not talking about debulking tumors. I'm talking about ablating the tumors with a margin. And uh, in fact, I'm going to have, I have a presentation in the conference tomorrow where I'll show you how I do it. And you put a, you have a nodule, a one centimeter nodule. You put an ablation catheter through the middle of it and you know the ablation zone is three centimeters. So you have one centimeter margin all the way around. And you can see on the CT scan that you've got the ground glass burnt area around it. That is very different from debulking an endoluminal lesion, leaving lesions in the mucosa. So to answer your question, uh, yes, the um, uh, segmentectomy is now becoming much more dominant and the number of courses we have around who are trying to teach people to segment, segmentectomy uh, vouch for the interest in it. And secondly, ablation is a real threat to our resection. So we have to adapt our resection to be good so that when all the pulmonologists are in the MDT, in the, in the, in the tumor board, they won't say, well, I'll ablate it because my result is better than your lobectomy. You lose too much lung and your patients become breathless. Thank you so much. I need to ask you regarding, I mean, you're most talking about uh, uh, thoracic oncology. What's your take on uh, inflammatory lesions? I mean, the A, B, C, D, where do we stand for inflammatory lesions? Um, I, I must say, in, in my practice in London, we don't deal with that many inflammatory lesions. Um, you mean aspergillomas, um, uh, TB, uh, bronchiectasis, and things like that. Um, it's interesting. I think the robot is actually quite good for it because um, uh, certainly you get a zoomed in view, you magnify the view, and you can dissect a difficult place much better. I feel a little bit uncomfortable because I have no control of the vessels if I need to. It's a bit more difficult to convert and run in. But increasingly, because we don't have many, we don't have much experience, increasingly we try to do it and we're only at the learning curve and building up the experience. But I can see advantages to it. So which port are we talking about? The port, uh, the option one, option uh, B, or option C? Uniportal or multiportal? It will be robotic. It will be multiportal robotic. Thank you. Yeah. And that's my view. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I, um, I, I look forward to meeting you in person next time. Yes, sir. Okay, bye-bye. I now take immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Pavan Goruganti, sir our director, Yashoda Group of Hospitals. And I uh, welcome Dr. Lingia, sir, 
Director Medical Services, Yashoda Group of Hospitals. I request Dr. Pavan sir to address the gathering for, with few words. So, uh, Dr. Pavan here is the uh, inspira inspiration for a number of us, HRTs, especially pulmonology and thoracic, the way he has supported our department, the way, way he is bringing uh, newer innovations into, into the hospital. Uh, is always been a support and an inspiring force for all of us in this hospital. Thank you so much. And uh, it's an immense pleasure. Say a few words to us. Yeah, thanks. Everybody here? Or? Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Dr. Balna. Thanks for the, uh, you know, I just uh, dropped in. Uh, yes, my background is uh, pulmonary medicine. I was in the U.S. Uh, 10 years or so, Upper Peninsula. Like uh, market, it would have been minus 20 by now, I think. It's uh, like uh, 200 inches of snow, ice, uh, snowmobiling and ice fishing and that kind of uh, fun. I was happily doing my one week on, one week off and uh, one month vacation because I have to go all the way to India working five months. Uh, but since five years, uh, almost uh, now I have... Uh, from 2018, so almost five years. So coming back now, mostly in my admin hat, uh, but uh, things have changed uh, dramatically here in India. Before going to US, many of these things were just unheard of, uh, Leo transplants and these things done somewhere abroad, but uh, pleasantly, like uh, everything else is uh, changing in the world. Like uh, yeah, nobody would uh, believe like we had 109 air ambulance transfers uh, during uh, last year. So air ambulance was first time when I heard was in Michigan, a patient come from above, okay, I thought was well, something exotic, but uh, these things, 25 ECMO simultaneously uh, during uh, COVID second wave. ECMOs also used to do rarely, but nowadays, uh, People have become uh, used to doing uh, ECMOs, uh, 25 ECMOs, all the uh, entire floor was uh, full of ECMO patients and half of them were uh, without ventilator, awake ECMOs. People were there for more than six months on, uh, on ECMO also, so that was a new experience for us, uh, but uh, things are changing. Nowadays, 15 to 20 liver transplants also we are doing uh, every month, so... Uh, healthcare wise uh, things are changing uh, pretty rapidly but uh, you know i think i dropped in a little un uninvited here i think i wanted to know what uh, surgeons are discussing uh, because uh, seems like all the fun is uh, from the surgical aspect uh, what is and all what goes on inside we don't know so chinabamba and all like uh, what are you like looks like uh, all all people are here uh, so surgical oncology thoracic cardiothoracic surgery probably everybody is looking into the same field uh, so pulmonary is uh, so you know, nowadays uh, like uh, things are advancing so that uh, as uh, speaker before said like there are so many options uh, we can do surgically we can do endoscopically so all of us should be like on our toes uh, otherwise uh, <laughs> this fi field is uh, everybody so looks like uh, that's great the uh, advances which are going on here so it's unimaginable previously i think uh, in india thoracic surgeon i remember like just like pulmonary was uh, like only for colds and uh, coughs they used to say when i was in mebs uh, medical school but now uh, like in the bronchus and all, you can see the intervention pulmonary has uh, taken a new meaning and uh, same with uh, thoracic also. I think Dr. Bala, maybe your time, cardiothoracic, cardiothoracic doctors were the absolute kings. Uh, whatever they say, everything was, uh, everything was uh, like uh, followed religiously. But uh, nowadays, cardiology is also doing uh, more intervention work and also thoracic is uh, picked up. I think uh, people are living longer and uh, people are living longer and uh, like uh, uh, disease profile is also changing nowadays um, 
malaria, typhoid, and all these things you're almost forgetting. But uh, but other diseases like I mean, it always be something I guess right. So influenza, COVID, and all these things, and uh, tuberculosis ever present. And most importantly, lung cancer uh, is increasing. Not only the squamous cell and all probably it's. Uh, uh, small cell is uh, decreasing, I think, nowadays, so forgetting all the subject also. So small cell probably is the only lung cancer which is decreasing when the other cancers are uh, increasing. And as people uh, live longer, we'll be confronted with uh, nodules and what to do with uh, them, smaller nodules to bigger nodules. And uh, like the extremes is transplants, but, uh, uh, but in my like uh, looks like oh, everything is uh, simple. Uh, we'll not get any more uh, robotics. I think video video games look easier. So <laughs> from my admin hat, I'm thinking. Uh, so like in like if we get too many of these equipments, it's uh, tough to justify all those things. So, so uh, I need to add a column five. <laughs> So how will uh, how will we get the viability and these things? Uh, no, just kidding. But. Uh, uh, doing uh, great work. So I was just in a pulmonary conference there, but uh, still looks like uh, we are not, not even close to your uh, thoracic people. Uh, everything looks uh, even more exotic here. So we wish you all the best. Uh, I mean, I'll not take too much of your time, but all of you need to, the younger uh, upcoming people and who wanted to upgrade their uh, knowledge, because this is absolutely essential though. Like what we did once upon a time is not applicable now. So we just need to be at the top of the game and you've done a great job as Dr. Bala and uh, entire thoracic team. Uh, Dr. Manjunath has also joined us here. Welcome, Manju. And uh, all of our team uh, here has uh, taken a lot of efforts to put in a great conference. And Dr. Bala was, uh, I think, maybe not sleeping for one month, I think, uh, to get uh, all of the leading luminaries here. So please do take a little time and ask whatever uh, smaller or bigger questions uh, you have, and uh, they'll be more than willing to answer you. I'll not take too much of your time as high quality didactics and uh, simulation and everything is there. So I wish, I'll uh, just wish you all the best. And uh, thoracic is just beginning. I mean, thoracic oncology, whoever does is uh, just beginning. We have a long way to go and a lot of people to treat and save lives. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much, sir. With our medical team, even we as in being admins are also very inspired by sir. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, we shall move to our next topic, robotic lobectomy inflammatory diseases. This has been delivered by Dr. Shaiwal Kandelwar, sir. Sir is from Max Super Specialty Hospital, New Delhi. Dr. Bala has already talked about four-arm completely port-based 
robotic vacuum technique. This is the most acceptable technique can be done in both the models, SI and XI. I think now the XI model is gaining popularity and few institutes still have SI model. I started my career with SI model and now I'm working on XI. In both the technology, there is a 12 mm assistant port which is used for stapling. Earlier we don't have the robotic staplers. Now we, these staplers are available at our institute. Occasional suction, specimen retrieval, exchange of items such as rolled of sponges, vessel loop, management of bleeding in case of pulmonary artery venous injury. The advantages we all know. To summarize, robotic system provides phenomenal vision and a great maneuverability of the robotic instrument. And therefore, there is a role of robotic, robotic technology in the management of inflammatory disease. It provides the benefits of minimal invasive therapy. There is a better view, no doubt about it. These videos don't justify the design you get on the console. There is an easier dissection of the edition, lesser bleeding than the open surgery or bed, excellent dissection at the thoracic outlet, which is difficult to manage with by back because of the torque on the instrument and ICG which is available in the XI platform can sometimes be used if there is some confusion regarding the vascularity. It's quite cheap, it's not a big thing within seconds you know about the vascular anatomy. So in my opinion, you have a great latest 4x4 SUV and you are going on a difficult terrain. This is what robotic technology is all about. A commonly encountered diseases are aspergilloma, bronchitis, lung abscess, lung hydratus. Talking about the robotic positioning and docking, this is the head end. The anesthesia trolley is extended by a long tubing which is kept on the foot end so that this head end area is remains free, remain free. The XI model, the boom comes from the side of the patient, the SI issue comes from this place. The first port is the camera port, which is made in the anterior axillary line at the level of the default cartilage. I don't usually count the rib spaces. The first port is here. This is the right arm, left arm, and the fourth arm for the retraction. Camera port, and here comes the assistant port of 12 mm. And this usually corresponds to the 7th intercostal sphere, the first one. There should be plenty of space between the two ports, the minimum should be 8 mm. By this method, most of the time I try to keep it more than 8, sometimes 10 is all feasible. So this avoids the clashing of the arm. I have learned this technique from uh, Professor Park from in MSCC. The robot is stopped. The surgeon is sitting here, this is the assistant, and we have the trolley here, nursing trolley. The prerequisites states are that the surgeon should be experienced to perform a open lobectomy. There is no definite need that he should have a prior breast experience. I have met plenty of uh, surgeons who have never done a breast procedure, but they are very competent in doing the robotic procedure. You should be able to handle the complications. The training in robotics is a must. Obviously, you need to know the driving, then only you can drive the car. Expert, bedside surgeon, fully competent surgeon, or an experienced assistant is mandatory. The brief pre-surgery team should be there. The surgeon and the assistant, the main team members, should be actually go to the radiology shoot and understand the anatomy before starting the procedure. There should be clear and frequent communication with each other, not only between the surgeon and the uh, assistant surgeon, but also the nurses and other team members. Regular drills with the whole team about the communication instruction, there should be no miscommunication that you said this, I understood this. Regular drills and protocols and emergency undocking. In our setup, most of the time there is a robot dedicated to OT, OT, not the thoracic OT. So that OT is having gynecological procedures, cardiac procedures, urological procedures, plenty of things. So you have to make sure that all the armamentarium is there before you start the case. This is a video of uh, 
robot is like pure vacuum for a cancer patient. So it's just to show the difference, key, how different a uh, inflammatory disease is. The left fourth arm forceps, tip of forceps is used for the reflection. It is very important to create an exposure. The inferior pulmonary ligament is taught and I do the mediastinal nodal dissection first. The advantage is that if you do the uh, nodal dissection first, your bronchovascular structures are automatically dissected. I start from the lower and follow the posterior mediastinum. This is a subparallel space, subparallel input dissection is done. The bronchus is exposed, right lower the bronchus. And then with the help of tip up, tip off. the station 11 lymph node or some lymph node between the intermediate bronchus and the lower lymph bronchus. Exposes the PA, the posterior window of the fissure is already opened. Right paratracheal lymph node dissection. Above there is I guess pain between the SVC and the vagus posteriorly. The whole lymph node packet is removed. is then dissected. The manipulation from the fourth arm is very important to create an adequate exposure. You follow the subadventitial plane over the pulmonary artery. The posterior window is already open. Do not force enter because it will cause bleeding and obscuring of the nodding. 
do not proceed further. Then wherever you are getting the space, put in a bed camera and start the blunt dissection of the lung with the chest wall with the help of bed camera and try to make the space for the second port. You will win the situation 90% if you are able to make the second and the third port. And then do all the adhesivalysis or the limited adhesivalysis so that you have enough space to dock the robot and once the robot is docked then you can dissect these adhesions, handle these adhesions very easily and all the instruments should be within, should be all these instruments should be introduced under design and avoid lung injury. With the XI robot, the beauty is that, that you don't have to change the position of the robotic boom. The most of the time the targeting it is done for a lobectomy or a segmentectomy. The targeting is done at the level of the superior pulmonary vein. If you have a facing challenge while dissecting the lower loop of the diaphragm, then you will reverse stop the, ro the robot. With the XI it is can be easily done. Make progress, there is no definitive sequence of dissection. Whatever structure comes first, just take it. If the fissure is developed, then go for the fissure first. In fact, the apical adhesions which are holding the lung at the apex, keep maintain the fissure open and there is an ease to do a dissection at the fissure. If the lymph nodes are causing problem, then only affect the lymph nodes, they will help in the exposure of the bronchovascular structure. Otherwise, in benign pathology, there is no need to do a complete lymph node dissection. If you anticipate a difficulty at the high level, take the proximal control first. This thing you have to anticipate is the language of the tissues. This is a type of lobectomy for the aspergillus you know, plenty of adhesions, limited dissection by vets and talk in the robot. The smoke is constantly being set, the ports are open. This is the anterior aspect, posterior aspect, apex and the base, superior pulmonary vein. You can appreciate the restrict movement of the robotic arms. In the previous model, the advantage was that we can just withdraw the arm and introduce the stapler or whatever de external device you want to do. But in XI model, it is not possible. You have one dedicated assistant board. Like the vein was taken from anterior aspect. Bronchus were dissected. Aspergilloma, dissecting the lung of the chest wall is another 50% of the operation, which is very difficult to do by rats, but very easily done with the help of a robot. It is almost a bloodless dissection as you can notice. Another video of a, this was a Afghani gentleman who had an inflammatory tumor coming from the left upper loop, coming to the left. Left upper loop going up to the left main bronchus, plenty of adhesions, top the robot, limited dissection of the adhesions so that all the arms can move easily. It's a destroyed upper loop, lower loop. We are dissecting the fissure, developing the fissure now. It's the lingular artery which came to the vision first. I'll always through the structure. Because it helps in the traction so that the stapler can be fine, uh, can go easily. And the assistant who is passing the stapler, he does not have a 3D vision, he has a 2D vision.
is a lymph node over the permanent region. Lymph node was moved and the superior permanent region comes into the region. Plenty 
majority of patients who have received this immunotherapy have very bad adhesions. And if you are trained by handling these inflammatory tissues, you can do those uh, lung infections also. Thank you. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, definitely, the difficult case, especially with inflammation all around. You have proved that uh, robotic technology can be used even for such difficult cases. I really appreciate this. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, we'll take questions at the end because we're already running late. So, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation.
and uh, we have found in this study that greater number of people was there uh, uh, elastic during the robotic so can grow and the bidding was lesser, the time was shorter. This, this was in, in our study. The most important component is RL nodes. I, I have started with thoracoscopy, so to migrate it to robot. The study, the telemetry filtration of the robo has helped us in doing a proper RL nodes, especially the opposite side as well as the autopulmonary leaf nodes. I showed in the video. And we always do robotic or we never do um, unless until budget is an issue and it's quite doable and it's quite standardized. We never use a double dimension and uh, because we found and there's no need of uh, doing a one lung ventilation at all and we use a prone or semi prone position and this is a prone and semi prone position. I just show the video. Thank you. 
track these figures to this side and do the dissection all round. And as a postman trick here, we can clear the root nodes all uh, from right prongus, left prongus, and uh, uh, do the dissection. Here, we, we can see the instruments so nicely we can go. And the anatomy is very different on the right side and left side. The right recurrent angle nerve goes around the vessel. This is where you can identify the vagus nerve. Always remove the lymph nodes in a pouch, never through the ports. It might cause pillage. And then, this is the way you remove the lymph nodes. You should use very minimal pottery here. Use bipolar pottery only. That's a vagus nerve and the RLN nerve. I strongly believe in removing the lymph nodes around the RLNs, whatever the window, and the subcarinal and all the perisital lymph nodes. So that's a, the that's a beauty of Robo, where you can identify the nerves very precisely, but initial cases we used to have trouble because we are using quadric mode. And later on we use a setting of one or two only and use not more than three or four files and then remove uh, and now we have changed this system also. We use saline during the surgery and so that during when there is the cautery, the saline does still force the saline over that. So the cautery damage is not there. The second change we have brought is we are using nerve monitoring during robotic surgery. So this has reduced our incidence of RLN uh, complications and uh, it is a matter of uh, very easy way to do the nodal dissection. That's a look from the window. The RLN on the left side is straight. You have to remember the anatomy and also the autonomous nervous system also courses along the trachea on the lateral border. So one should be very careful and distinguish between two. Sometimes uh, the autonomic nervous system looks as if it's the RLN. So we should be careful and never never uh, denude the nerves. We should never denude the nerves um, uh, when we are doing. There is no need to show the assistant that nerve is white. So some amount of adventitia tissue you have to uh, you have to keep it. I will not show the abdomen part. And uh, with the advent of uh, with the advent of uh, just uh, have time. Yes, sir. Four minutes. So with the advent of robotic uh, uh, staplers, it's found very easy. It's a lower uh, G junction growth. We, we resected the specimen and then we brought the IEM there and using a stapler, the robotic stapler, to do the side-to-side -side anastomosis. The, the, the first case which I have shown. And then um, we sent it for the further section, ensure that margins are free, and then uh, we use the stapler. We get, um, this is a side-to-side esophago -side jejunostomy. And then the tumor specimen is already lowered down. And then we use a, another stapler across, below the anastomosis. Uh, that will uh, reset the specimen, I just showed it. So this is the way we do that. Do a side to side and then transect above the tumor, give a margin and you can always send for further section, pull the specimen down there. And the robotic stapler, I found it very useful, though it's expensive. I think 45,000 rupees and each, each fire costs around 9,000 rupees. But uh, for these type of cases, I found it quite useful um, in, in, because you can manipulate it easily inside. You can manipulate it uh, easily inside. Uh, assistant, we did not show that assistant that is not showing properly, and surgeon himself does the fire. And then the rent can be because the robotic platform is a beautiful platform to suture. We can just put the right switch there and suture the red. And another instrument costs another 24,000, so I use the bipolar only to suture. So you can see here, it's actually not a real border. So these are the different things we can do to the robotic instrument approach. And cone, semicolon, anticolon, anticolon, is a course. I feel the world is changing, the Boston scientific, uh, there have been a lot of study where sensors are kept and surgeons may operate with mind and nanobots uh, which are coming in a big way where the data this may operate and force placement is very important uh, in these uh, um, surgeries and one needs over a period of time to work and adapt. Our mission is to teach robotic surgery across India and hopefully make a robot in India
Mumbai Indians and for others. Uh, hopefully we get support from many institutes. And I thank Ishoda Hospital for uh, letting me start my experience journey here. And thank Chinabhu and uh, Amris who is my ISP alumni. And Chinabhu and uh, Hemant who were with me for a long time. Thanks so much for giving this opportunity. Chance to work on uh, this Indian robot, sir, SS Mantra? Yeah, uh, <laughs> but, but I mean, like, <laughs> we, would, we would in fact like to know more about it. Yeah, I worked on CMR, I worked on Hugo, I worked on Mantra. Um, there are, I think, one, it will take another four or five years to launch. So I went to Sharjah and operate on this. Mantra is a good concept, actually, owned by Chinese. The promoters are Chinese, it's been, it's been Basically, the funds, everything is going there, and it is a poor, poor uh, duplicate of the machine. If you if you operate suddenly it stops suddenly, and the movements are very slow. One, one, when you operate on a da Vinci, your movement go on like a fluid. You should be able to do properly, and a lot of FDA regulations are there, and you always have online uh, online videos where you can check across it, and you have a bio engineer who monitors your movements and safety protocols are there. And the movements are very fine, very nice, very delicate. When you, when you, when you operate, you know as a surgeon, the movement, the lag, there is a lag in mantra. So it is a lot of, lot of, uh, lot of uh, years to go before mantra becomes. Secondly, CMR, CMR also again is a, is a single port and a lot of things. And immersive 3D is the biggest advantage of the individual. That is, you sit there and you go inside and operate. It's not a screen, it's not the same. And the other one is, um, Hugo is okay, but the company, the people themselves don't know how much it costs, what it tells the surgeons, even the representatives of Metronomics don't know uh, what's the future for them, they don't know the cost of the listing and they are pricing more than x robo which is a gold standard in most of the developing countries. So other companies are still confused and then Metronomics was very, uh, very early they were launched it. They should have done the field work. They should have done a proper job before they have launched in India or other places. No, no. Sivasa, Sivasa is a promoter. Is a promoter of that. If you see the money train, it goes there. <laughs> Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, Jyoti sir. Just one question. Uh, uh, what is your take on uh, the Ajagas Veil? You already mentioned it's a personal choice, but with respect to the Ajagas Veil, I think that is the surgeon's nightmare during this project to me. So, do you prophylactically ligate the Ajagas Veil or uh, you would. Uh, oh. Sir, I am always appreciative, appreciative of your work. Uh, you have traversed such a long journey. Probably in Kidwai, it was uh, no vision, just feel, haptic feel and take out the esophagus and transhiatal. And now, obviously it is one of the uh, cradles of esophageal surgery.
And so now, uh, now it's all visual. But do you ha get that haptic feel now? They say with the VATS and all, you yeah, get. Yeah. Uh, Especially, do you see the thoracic duct and all? Are they visible or you just... Uh Fantastic, sir. Congratulations on your voluminous work.
that will be used with the C marker. We did choose uh, selected the other space, so this is the uh, supposed to be the primary uh, approach. It's a mass scaling uh, approach uh, that provides elements with a good visualization of the high and a good exposure to the program cavity with a wider utility in Chichen, because you're opening the cluster space anteriorly, where the cluster space is wider. And it can be easily converted to primary paracotomy if something happened or if needed. So uh, you can see the comparison uh, between the report and the real report and the primary report on graphs. You can see it's wider than the uh, than the regular uh, report. So good for the relative uh, placement through the uh, C report. So I would like to show you one of the, uh, the cases. It's a um, young female patient, 28 years old, with a large carcinoma tumor in the right prolong, reaching the, the main left bronchus, with a pulmonary fascia that was adequate. And um, at this point, we didn't know if the patient would need a bronchial sleeve, directly or bronchopathic directly. So we decided to perform the first perimamary by portal robotic uh, let me show you the, uh, the video. Okay, this is the uh, endoronchial lesion. This is the C marking uh, of the approach. Uh, I would like to show you how we do the primary approach. So basically, the four, and that patient was a little bit more than four, four point two, four three point three centimeter in the perimamary form. We, uh, you know, the design is a kind of tissue up to see the uh, serratus, the muscle. So then we flip up the tissue. As you can see, open the uh, intercostal space, use the field the space, space, uh, wound retractor, and then you have the approach uh, ready. So you can see how we play the, the arms to the scope, procedure, one arm, and one more trotter for the uh, second arm. We didn't have any problem with the section of the, in the feature of uh, the pulmonary artery branches, so we are dissecting now the uh, posterior ascending artery. We divided all of them uh, easily, uh, having a good exposure and a good approach anteriorly. So as uh, you can see, the uh, staple is coming from the uh, single port. This is probably the only way to see the uh, uh, Apical branches, and even you, you can be divided from the uh, posterior no? uh, axis. Instead of doing regularly what we do by the portal uh, path, we have to dissect more anterior. No? We are still dissecting the uh, apical posterior branches now. You can see it's a, this is the fissure. You can see how can we do it easily by the perimeter uh, approach, which is just the high one is in front of the axis. So we divide the last uh, branches. The uh, the vein uh, was divided through the posterior uh, proper, so easily. So this is uh, becoming oblique when we have already dissected the superior vein. So very really easy to, to divide. As you can see, there was no uh, collision between the arms. Uh, and finally, we dissected the, uh, the airway right? So we are dissecting now first the lymphadenectomy around the, uh, the right upper, the left upper uh, bronchus. This is the main bronchus. And the, the secondary carina with the, the left lower bronchus. So we are doing the lymphadenectomy first to expose the airway. And uh, at that point, we didn't know exactly if the tumor was invading the main bronchus here or not. So we opened a little bit the uh, left upper lower bronchus to see if the tumor was just by the inside or was not invading the, the airway. So we did the tumor. We could normalize a little bit the tumor up and see if there is no invasion of the uh, main uh, uh, main bronchus, so we divided completely the uh, 
I saw your video. You go from the fifth intercostal space. Uh, Diego and even I have started doing uniportal uh, robotic surgeries. We, I feel that seventh intercostal space is a better approach. What do you say? Uh, you saw the yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but the uh, instruments don't come like this, uh, straight away. Yeah, yeah, because I had one problem one time, I had went through 7th intercostal space and the tumor was stuck at the hilum. So, it took me almost 6-7 hours to fi figure out because uh, here we, we charge the robot uh, for the patient 1.4 lakhs to 2 lakhs extra along with robotic staplers. It comes around to be 2.5 lakhs and if you tell them that you have done open surgery, then it is like a big uh, thing. They don't understand that it is done for safety reasons or something like that. So, I had to do a camera port another in the fifth intercostal space and do by vats, yeah. something yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, really nice video. Yeah, yeah, enjoy. So, uh, when, when, when you go on with the perimemory approach, uh, wouldn't the heart be in your way, supposing you, you have a hypertensive uh, patient who has some LV hypertrophy, some car cardiomegaly? Will the heart be in, in your way? Yeah, 
institution of theory. I'm hoping it's an institution at a regular point in Uniportal Arts or Uniportal Robotics. So we have a little bit more anterior uh, approach, <coughs> wider in the institution, but far away from the Afghan uh, Harbor. Uh, and when you convert, supposing you have a problem, you, you want to convert, how do the institution go? Because your primary is here. Yeah. How, how do the institution go? The, the institution on the primary form. Uh, the, this idea that you Sir, how much, uh, how important is uh, pre-operative imaging in deciding which approach to take? Would so, uh, it's not a big deal. So uh, uh, I have done a lot of procedure uh, by the portal, the uh, imaging portal, that less robotic, but it's not a big deal. So for all my female patients, I'm going through the epidemiology uh, for uh, all kind of procedure, vasectomy, synectomy, the complication, whatever. So you feel uh, it need not be, the approach need not be changed depending on uh, the hilum. Fantastic. That's really impressive. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now let's go to the last topic for this workshop. That is Uniportal Tracks by Dr. Manjunath Bhalesar. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will start off with saying that uh, Uniportal Robotic uh, is just a, a brother for Uniportal Wax. Whoever has that Uniportal Wax will be keen and I think uh, mostly will be perceived as the next uh, best thing to do uh, in terms of uh, robotic surgeries. So uh, it's like this is what uh, I think we start off with. In open surgery it was more messy. Then we, like, we try to refine with laparoscopy and wax. And now robotics is like we are trying to refine it better and better. We want to feel the same taste, but we want to use, uh, we don't want to use, uh, dirty our hands, so I can say that. So uh, my journey with the labor started in 2019, so he is my mentor, and uh, he was the first person to do this uh, procedure in uh, uh, Spain in uh, 2021, and we were lucky to have him in Apollo in 2022 uh, uh, March. So we did the first uh, import robotic surgery in India. So a few of the things which I want to discuss today, because it's about uh, tricks and tips. Uh, so the first thing is patient selection for a beginner and uh, also a beginner. Uh, selection of incision, uh, what, side, what, what, what should be a side of incision, where, what propeller should be used, what instrument should be used and how to build a team. So the first thing is patient selection. To, to begin with, I think initially we should do some simple cases like bolectomy, plication, posterior medicine tumors, which are not going to be troublesome, okay, even if you convert to a bat, you are not worried much. So I think that's, that's the first uh, thing and then we go for a simple lobectomy for in case of a uh, uh, lung cancer, which is when we have uh, definitive claims, prefer a lower lobe or an upper lobe to begin with because you have, uh, like because the axis of the dissection is only one one way and it will be easier for you. And then once we gain about, like say about 20 cases or 25 cases, then you can start going uh, the more complex to get me. And the second important aspect is the incision, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bush was discussing. The 7th inch space uh, for an upper is preferred. Mostly because of the angulation you get for the staples. If you place the incision at 50 percent space, then you will never get the angle for the, uh, for the staples. 
and uh, Dr. Ramanda was doing that he was using another port for the stainless. So that was the difference between using a bipod and a unipod. In a bipod, you can always have an option of taking, a, taking another a, a stapler from the other incision and using this uh, the, the utility incision for the scope and the left hand. Left hand. If you if you are only trying to go unipod, try to do it at a lower space and uh, uh, for, for a lower you can even go down, go, go as low as 8 in the bottom space and to begin with make a little bigger incision like say, let's say about 2.5 or 5 cm incision so that your arm clashing gets reduced and you are at much more uh, freedom. And uh, uh, this is uh, the wound, uh, generally the wound crater what we use, it's a small size wound, extra, extra small size because once you use an extra small size one, the, uh, the uh, ring of the wound protector doesn't bother you when it's inside. Otherwise, you know, if you place a the smaller or a medium sized one, the moment you place the camera, you're always seeing the ring of the wound protector. So that becomes a big headache. So try to use this as much as possible. And then once you dock the, uh, once uh, the, uh, the instrument uh, placement is such that the camera is uh, at the uh, most posterior part or at the highest part because uh, if your eyes are above, your hands is what the wax, uniform to wax teaching was. A similar teaching is here. We use the uh, camera port at the most posterior part and then you have the two working ports. In the XI, we have an option to swap the uh, arms. So you swap the arms between the left hand and the camera so that the camera actually comes in the middle and your uh, arms are uh, with your right hand. <coughs> so this is how the uh, uh, instrument, uh, the trocars are placed. They are generally, this is about 4 cm incision, so you can place three arms easily. So, in fact, Diego uh, showed us that uh, there was uh, the instruments. What now? What we are using the, the trocars are the toss trocars, which are used for transfer or robotic. In that, the uh, this uh, this bulkiness of the this thing is reduced. They are much thinner, so we can use them easily. So, it, the uh, the instrument clashing at this point where the instrument go in and come out become lesser. So, this is how the instrumentation is uh, when we uh, start the procedure. This is uh, where when you want to use CO2, you use a glove and ins insert all the instruments through this and then uh, proceed with the procedure. So this is just a video, uh, uh, we uh, actually presented at the HC. See, like as I was telling that, see, this is the plural layer. So, uh, as Balasa was 
saying, I think we start off with doing uh, a decortication in most of our cases and then we actually go for a lobectomy. So, uh, most of it is the same. I will uh, uh, move it a little fast in view of a short of time. You can see that the dissection is not, not great, but then uh, it doesn't look great, but then that's what we deal with every day on a day to day basis. After uh, I think almost after, after three hours or something, we start looking at the uh, venous structures. You can see this is the artery, transverse uh, uh, anterior, so that we can uh, now we can just try to mobilize the bed. So in, in unipotent robotic, the advantage is the, the suction part is actually very helpful because uh, the assistant can keep your area clean, and then uh, that helps you a lot. And uh, the staplers also, I think the robotic staplers are very helpful because they give you a very good angle. This is the superior pulmonary vein. So you have these tiny posterior segmental veins which are divided. Again, uh, most of the blood loss is from the chest wall dissection itself. So we have to try and minimize as much as possible. We use quartry as much as possible in, in places. And even the bronchial uh, dissection will not be easy, generally because of the dense calcified electrodes there. Uh, you, you won't find a good plane to even mobilize the bronchus properly. So one of the important uh, things uh, in uh, unipolar robotic is uh, the incision is so low that if you have to convert to an open surgery, if there is a catastrophe, it is a very difficult task and uh, you need a very uh, uh, good assistant at the bedside to <coughs> take, uh, take things under control and uh, deal off the rover. You see there is barely any planes here. We, 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 we had a very tough time to dissect this whole thing.
without much issues. So, uh, and this was the incident. So, one of the things uh, uh, which we feel is like uh, in Unicode was bad, so the discussion was when people started doing it, the pain is lesser. I think the pain with Unicode robotic is we have to still analyze, there are a lot of things to be seen. We, we are six, 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 really at this stage, we have done about 25 cases now. So the pain does appear to be a little lesser than multiport. At least the multiport one, especially the, the trocar one where we use the 12mm is not painful. Then the rest of the 8mm ones, 8mm ones are generally not painful. But the 12mm one is definitely painful. Patient is still complaints of pain at that side. Other than that, uh, we have to see how uh, how well we can utilize this. Because definitely there is, in, in all these tough conditions, when you want to use a multiport, you are you are forced to do wax for some time and then lock the instrument. Whether is it really benefiting the surgeon? I am not sure because if you are doing most of the dissection by wax, then what's the point of placing the robot? And uh, the other thing is, uh, if you uh, if if the conversion rates are more with wax, I think it's better to switch to a multiport or a uniport robot, whichever is convenient. Thank. You. So uh, so. Uh, I had a array on the robo robotics A plus. So uh, when you use robotics A plus, unless the lung hanging is like really soft and normal, the stay A plus refuses to fire or, or even clamp. Yes. So would you go to a black one or do you regularly use black A plus? In fact, the black I had a failure uh, two weeks back, so it was a tough one to decide. But then I saw that the, the failure was mainly because there was some staple lines coming at the, uh, the there was uh, the crotching of the staplers. So I think that was the main reason I felt it was failure. Purple is also available, I think. So. No, purple is not available. <coughs> blue is available. Blue is available. Blue is available. Yeah, recently black I had a problem. I had uh, put the uh, blue for bronchus, but it was showing me uh, thick tissue, thick tissue, it was persistent. No, blue will be thick over thick. Yeah, it, it, shows that it's yeah thick. it was thick, but then I forcibly <laughs> made the robot and it cut it. <laughs> One of the ways to do it is if you have a very thick vision, you can clamp it twice or thrice. Yes, yes. Clamp it, clamp it, and then. Clamp it and then. Yeah. 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 Any other question? Have you fractured a rib? No. My uniportal. Not Recently, really. I had a fractured one seven three probably. No, but I because had doing I this stapler, uh, it was not. I was not getting the vision or uh, this thing exact location because in India we don't get uh, curved tip staplers. These are straight tip staplers. So take the angle. Probably that rib gone ripped off. One of the things <laughs> with the stapler is you try to get it to the lowermost, uh, uh, just above the rib. Just try to pass it with the lowermost aspect. It will be helpful. We had one, uh, one uh, conversion uh, for a ligulectomy where we were trying to find a nodule. We couldn't find a nodule, I had to open up it. It was a very difficult one because the incision was lower down. Uh, yeah, the was there. So it was very difficult. It's, if you have to convert, I think it's very difficult because the iron is not here within your region. Yes, especially the seventh intercostal space, uh, there is always a fear that if I need to convert, especially you are doing right upper lobectomy or left upper it's lobectomy, very it's very difficult. So yeah. that's why I have decide, uh, devised, you can always put a camera in fifth intercostal space, just go with wax and rather than uh, taking down a hole, control the situation and uh, by wax you can carry on without opening uh, or uh, this thing. No. The problem is not that if you have a bleeding or something at the high level, then uh, going through the seven will be a difficult one. Definitely, definitely. What about the point? Because the people are sitting on the stage. Now, when you have a problem with the robotic stage, you cannot reach the point. I mean, when we cannot reach the uh, the point with the uh, robotic staple and you're going through the fifth or sixth intercostal space, take one of the arms out and use the regular. Yeah, that's right. That is also But the, if something happens, you have uh, access and control to the high lamp. You can always separate one arm out. One arm. Yeah. Thank you. 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 I just have a small query. I hope my comment is taken in the right uh, spirit. Uh, when we are looking at all the videos, it seems when the conventional teaching of thoracic surgery, the conventional principles of thoracic surgery teaching, 
uh, you identify this structure, then proceed this, proceed this, and then you divide it. All that seems to have gone for a toss. Is it? Is it that uh, you see what you, uh, you divide what you see and then proceed to the next? You divide what you see and proceed to the next? No, uh, I'll tell you this. How divergent are we here? No, I'll answer this question. So before uh, starting any lobectomy, the first principle is to mobilize the whole posterior and anterior hilum. That is done in all the cases. Whether it is an aspergilloma, whether it's a lung cancer, you know. First, and then sorry. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I, I'll answer, sir. And then uh, I would prefer to take an artery first. But if the vein is more anterior, if it's not obscuring the artery too much, I take the vein first because that will make my artery dissection easier. Of course, if you are wasting too much time after division of the vein, then you'll have the congested lung. Yeah, I will add one thing. What my strategy is there. Identify all the structures, loop them and clip it. Don't take an irreversible step at initial stage. Yeah. yeah. If at all you are 100% sure that this is upper lobal vessel only, not the middle lobal vessel, then I'll give you fire staples. If any doubt, loop it and keep aside, start dissecting the artery, start dissecting the bronchus, start dissecting the posterior ascending artery. When you have all everything dissected out, just go on firing the staples. That saves a lot of time of putting the stapler inside out, inside out. So because just to go through the various surgeries we have seen today, uh, just now, the first thing we do is to divide the inferior pulmonary ligament. Yes. That was done at the last step here. <laughs> because uh, similarly, no, I'm not commenting. No, no. I just want the opinion of the experts because you're all experts here doing these surgeries. <laughs> Second, when we look at the left upper lobectomy, Conventional teaching is you identify the arteries to the lingula and then you would start dividing the arteries or rather first you take con control over the pulmonary artery, you start dividing the arteries from the, identifying the arteries of the lingula, get the lobe above, then you do the pulmonary vein and then you do the bronchus. But uh, we have seen that the vein was clamped first, then the bronchus and then we were doing the arteries. Uh, so. That's why I, that's what I'm saying. Is it uh, is it that you follow what is convenient, or do you follow those traditional teaching methods? <laughs> in, in my opinion, sorry. Yeah. yeah. In, in my opinion, there is only a systematic way to approach the uh, the, the high lung or the tumor. I think the the way that you need to resect the tumor safely. So how many times? No, we have deal uh, with the uh, uh, tumors invading the uh, no, pulmonary artery anteriorly and the superior vena cava supposed to be resectable and we did the opposite. We started dividing the bronchus, then the uh, artery and then keeping the last part, the vein and the uh, superior vena cava because it's uh, easy to control it at the end of the procedure. No, why I'm asking this question is that during open surgery we have this option of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So, uh, is that option difficult? Whereas in robotic surgery, uh, probably you have better vision and you can see each vessel properly. So, is that an advantage compared to uh, flipping over or that's what? Flipping over, definitely I do. Many times so there is confusing anatomy. First of all, I look at the CT scan very clearly and I tell the patient how the vessel configuration is there. And visualizing the brain simulation, simulated before going for on the surgery that uh, this is going to be my road map. And once I am clear, I will dissect out all the vessels, uh, loop them up, flip it anterior posteriorly, confirm, recheck it. E even before bronchus, I will clamp it, ask the anesthetist to inflate, all the traditional teaching goes. Because uh, there are students working with me who will be operating the next generation uh, robotic surgery. So I have to be more systematic in these uh, areas. And as far as uh, we are dealing with a lot of cancers, so we do a lot of mediastinal nodal dissection first, that clears off the all anatomy before. And uh, inferior pulmonary ligament, itching the middle lobe to the, that can be always done at first step of it, the last It's step. not going to change your steps anyways. Inferior pulmonary ligament can be released at yeah. any point. And if you are dealing with the apical adhesions, we don't remove the apical adhesions initially. I go to the hilum, dissect out the hilum, everything, and then the last, it acts like a natural retractor for my lobe. Yeah. And inferior pulmonary ligament is released so that your uh, post-op uh, space problems are reduced. So whether you do it at the beginning or at the end, the, we are not compromising the principles of the surgery itself. So only thing is in uh, 
conventional open lung surgery, we like the lung to be in our hand. Yeah. So that makes it feel safer. <laughs> That's why probably in fifth space it felt much more mimicking a natural open Yeah, I, I agree. That, that, is the, that is the fallacy of the pro yeah. procedure. I agree. that That's the first thing I told. Like, fifth space, I don't know. I'm not it looks so beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, that is another question I wanted to ask that there is so much of, uh, of course we don't have any experience in robotic, but there is so much of, uh, there was a comment again that don't underestimate the power of the robotic arm. Yes, yes. yes. So, uh, does it, uh, yes, yes, yes. especially sir, lung... Sir, actually, there is an option of reducing the movements from yours to the robot. It's like 2 is to 1 or 1.5 is to 1. So, if you're doing a movement like this, for example, I'm lifting this, if I'm applying a force of 1, 1.5, it will be actually transit, transmitted to the patient at two, as up to 1. So, that option you have on the robot. The, the thing is, you have to have a, a clearer vision so that you don't do anything stupid like pulling or something as you said. Definitely the this thing is very stronger and the instruments themselves, if they go inside, they can cause a lot of damage. Yes, I had one instance, uh, first uh, uniportal left upper lobectomy I was doing, it was a tiry day, uh, it was the status were left, I had to suture all the pulmonary vessels and then divide. My assistant was a staff nurse, I, I am not privileged to get good doctors or staff nurses to assist me. He had put the Maryland into the left upper lobe and it hit the pulmonary artery and it, the lobe became big in size. That is also possible if you don't have a trained assistant. But very interesting insights from all the experts. Thank you for all the beautiful insights. Thank you. So, Dr. Bala, can we declare the session closed? <coughs> Thank you. The session is closed. seated for some time. We would now like to have a token of appreciation. I request Dr. Bala sir to come on to the dais. I request Dr. Amrish Malapati sir to please come on to the dais. And request everyone to applause for them. <laughs> Dr. Anita Balaman, please come on to the dais. round of applause. Can I now request Dr. Bhushan Tamber, sir? Shaiwal Kandelwal, sir. <laughs> Dr. Jagdishwar Gaut, sir. Okay. Last but not the least, Dr. Robert Santana, sir. Sorry, not made to Santana, sir. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I would really thank everyone to be a part of the workshop. Uh, now let's have a quick tea break. And all the delegates of, who are here for uh, the workshop, kindly please come back here and seat it. We'll move ahead. Before that, I can I have all the faculty?
faculty for a group photo workshop is planned in the ot but then please be seated here after the tea break all the delegates before that i request all the faculty and the chairpersons to please come on to the dais for a group photo Abhijit sir, please join. Thank you so much, sir.